this meeting to order. This is the March 21st uh, Committee on Community Resources meeting. Um, and we, um, Pam, do you want to take a roll? I, I will do that, sure. Councilor Bidwell. Here. <coughs> Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Shera. Here. And Councilor Klein has uh, contacted me to say she's going to be a little bit late, but we'll be here. Um, so I see we have some public. Um, so <laughs> would anyone like to make public comment? It's now a time if anyone wants to comment on. There's also the second half of this meeting um, is going to be sort of a public forum. So feel free to comment then if you'd rather. But um, if anyone has anything they'd like to comment on now? No? That's fair. No? OK. All right. Um, so uh, I'll announce we're being audio and video recorded. Um, and may I have a motion to approve the minutes from February 22nd and March 8th? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opponents, abstentions? Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing that we have up on the agenda is the ordinance pertaining to water resources. Uh, I'm going to read it, and then um, we can put it on the floor. So, uh, 16.034, ordinance relative to public ownership of Northampton's water resources. Be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows, section 1. <coughs> the second 325 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Article 1, water resources. 325-1, <coughs> public ownership of water resources. The public water resources and infrastructure of the City of Northampton, including systems and facilities related to the supply, storage, treatment, and distribution of water, shall be owned and or controlled by the City of Northampton and shall not be sold, leased, or transferred into private ownership. Section 2, that the article titled um, Water Use Regulations be moved directly before 325-2 and that the article titles within Chapter 325 be renumbered, Article 2, Water Use Regulations, Article 3, Water Emergencies and Restrictions, and Article 4, Drinking Water Protection. Um, I have a motion to um, uh, refer this with a positive recommendation. Or we also, I believe Councilor O'Donnell is here to discuss it, so if you'd rather discuss first. Well, and we, then we, we, let's get on the floor. I'll, 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 I'll move that we forward with a positive recommendation. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, Councilor O'Donnell, does anyone want to discuss it before we hear from Councilor O'Donnell? No, we might have, I mean, we, are, we just vote. Well, let's Actually, we, we, vote just, we, we, vote we, again, we prematurely voted. We should hear oh, about it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, that <laughs> That's okay. I'd like to hear about it. We always change our mind. Should I present it anyway? I love it. Yes, please. Do that, please. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair and, and Councilors. Uh, this is an ordinance that, as it says, would um, prohibit future council councilors, uh, city councils, or mayors, or the city in general from uh, privatizing the water infrastructure uh, of our city. Um, it's actually based on an ordinance on the books in the city of Gloucester, Mass, which. Um, did this in 2010 and subsequently put similar protections in their municipal charter later. And the reason for that is that an ordinance prohibiting a council from doing something is, is um, fine and good, but you can always repeal an ordinance. And so Gloucester later took the step and put it in their charter effectively. Um, I've been interested in this for a long time. And I thought now is a good time to bring it forward since we're in the middle of a discussion about investments we're making in our water infrastructure in the city. And that's the local reason and the national reason, of course, is there's a lot in the news about water resources, um, including uh, what's happening in uh, Flint, Michigan. Um, the basic premise of the ordinance is that there are certain public resources that should not be privatized. <coughs> and you take the, the Flint case, for example, which is um, a case where a city's water system is now poisoned by lead. And that was not directly a result of privatization of the water system, but it was a result of, in the case of Flint, emergency managers being appointed and really comporting themselves as though they were a corporate utility <coughs> with no public accountability in making decisions that 
prioritize cost cutting uh, as opposed to public health and the well-being of the community. Um, I think it's important that we prevent that as a general principle in, in the city. Actually, it's a, a thing that I would like to, that I would recommend to any city in the Commonwealth. Um, and that's what this does. It's, it's actually, you know, one sentence long. Um, my hope would be is that if, if it meets with a favorable reception in the council, that the next time the charter review process rolls around, we could talk about putting in the, in the charter at that point. Uh, but I think it's important because we're investing a, a large amount in our water resources, and I think Northampton has outstanding water resources, and we should protect them into the future. So that's the rationale. So I gather there, there, there was no specific initiative taken by any, there was no privatization initiative that you're aware of. This is just to foreclose, to stave off any possibility of such. Yeah, exactly. And I, I brought this to the mayor, and um, one of the reasons he's the co-sponsor is we want to make it clear that neither the council nor the mayor is seeking to do this. Um, so it is more forward thinking as a, as a precaution. Um, than it is addressing any kind of wolf at the door. In the, in the case of Gloucester, the Gloucester ordinance came about through considerable grassroots activism. They did have a wolf at the door. They had someone trying to buy their water system. Um, and you, you you know, it's not so much a problem anymore. You saw it a, a great deal during the, the giant recession we had when um, cities had few resources and, and kind of overdue maintenance needs and there was this pressure to privatize. But I think in the future, I mean, you don't have to look much farther than the American West to see the um, um, the water scarcity that they're having, and and to know that um, the issue of of uh, monetizing public water is, is an issue that I think will become more prevalent in the future. So yes, it is very forward looking, and um, I think we'd be only the, the second city in, in the in the Commonwealth to do this. But I would expect more to look at it. Anyone, Mr. Carney, do you have any questions? No. Well, thank you for considering. Thank you. Um, well, we've already voted on it, but we could change that. <laughs> Would anything, anyone like to discuss about it? No? No, I, 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 I appreciate the forward-looking mm -hmm. nature of, of, of this. I think, it's a, I think it's an excellent idea. I agree. I'm always impressed with Councillor O'Donnell's ability to just find, come up with ideas that no one else is thinking about. Um, it's very impressive. So thank you for those. Or, or cause trouble, however you want to phrase it. Either way. Um, all right. On we agree. <laughs> so we'll let our vote stand on this. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> um, okay. So. I don't have any new business. Does anybody else have new business they'd like to discuss? No? Okay. So then we're going to move into talking about the committee study request. Um, the first, well, I would say the first thing to do is would be to um, to actually finally vote to approve the request, but I am, I'm a little bit reluctant to do that until so Councillor Klein gets here, um, particularly since she hasn't been part of, she wasn't part of the previous discussion. So, um, if it's okay with the two of you, I would like to just start discussing the draft that Councillor Bidwell And created. I just have a question. Yeah. I thought that we had, I, I didn't uh, check the minutes there, but I thought that we had approved, I thought we had decided that we would move forward with the study request. We didn't take an official vote of it. Oh, um, okay. Part, it wasn't on the agenda for that for that special meeting that we had. Um, it was sort of I more see. of a general discussion, and so we were going to vote first thing now. Um, but why don't we hold off a little bit? Okay. It seems a little bit weird to start making plans when we haven't voted to accept something, but nevertheless. Um, Okay, so everyone has a copy of the the draft that Councilor Bidwell was so kind enough to work up for us. Um, 
And anyone have any any sort of initial thoughts or discussion about it? Well, I might just <coughs> you want to yeah, explain well, yeah. it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, shall I? Maybe I should re should I read it for since we were getting quite an audience. Um, why don't I go ahead and read it? So we this is a proposed sort of work plan for this committee study request that we've received in this committee. Um, so it says proposed approach for responding to the city council's committee study request, CSR, regarding issues relative to the local economy with an emphasis on issues facing downtown Northampton and Florence. Um, expectations, one, compile and make, and make available current information from various sources within the city administration and elsewhere pertaining to current conditions and trend lines regarding downtown Northampton and Florence. Two, Hold public hearings to solicit testimony from citizens from all facet of, facets of Northampton's economy. This includes property owners, business owners, workers, representative organizations, and consumers. And three, after the closing of public hearings, deliberate over information and testimony received and decide if there are potential areas where the city council could, in the months ahead, have a helpful impact. <clears throat> and then sort of, there's sort of a beginning of a month-to-month -month plan. Um, so at this, our our, uh, it's actually should be March 21st meeting. Uh, <clears throat> the committee will vote on whether to accept the study request from the City Council. If yes, then the committee ado adopts a rough plan for how to proceed over the next three to four months. The committee will hear 15 minute presentations from three or four identified interest groups. The committee chair will extend invitations asking if these presentations include data and survey results that might be informative for the CSR and include recommendations for council action. Submission of related written reports would be welcome. The committee chair will solicit presentations from the city's economic development director, a representative of wage earners in downtown Northampton and Florence from the Pioneer Valley Workers Center, a representative of the Downtown Neighborhood Association, and or a representative from the Chamber of Commerce. As a public forum, representatives of other groups and of the public at large are welcome to briefly present their recommendations to the committee. Then at the April 19th meeting, the committee may elect to solicit representations uh, from additional groups and experts, and the committee will, maybe that should be presentations, not representations, the committee will deliberate on data and supports and reports submitted and on recommendations received and will identify a list of areas where the city council might have an opportunity for impact. Individual committee members will be tasked with studying these areas, and the committee will schedule public hearings and discuss other ways to solicit participation from a broad cross-section of those involved in the downtown's economy. And then the, the, fall, the next two meetings, May 16th and June 20th, um, we, is down here tentative that we'll have those public hearings. And then um, at the June 20th meeting, we'll, we'll, the committee will discuss conclusions, recommendations, and possible next steps for the CSR. Um, so that is sort of the draft plan. That one, we have. One, so yeah. the April 19th, that one thing we did talk about at the last meeting was whether or not we wanted to change that date due to it being school vacation week. True. So did, um, we, did we settle on a different date? Or? We talked about doing it the previous week also on a Tuesday because mm -hmm. um, because the Monday is ordinance or legislative matters. Yeah. Well, as we go through this discussion, we may also want to add an additional date because right now we just we, we sort of have time scheduled for two public hearings. If we want another one, we might have to we might have to do a bunch of different scheduling. So maybe we'll look at that in a, a little bit later. Um, any any other thoughts on this plan or how to proceed? My um, notes indicate that you didn't come up with a bit, an alternative date to okay. the April, so <coughs> I'm going to do that. Well, I, I, I would just add that as the <coughs> author of this, if you will, um, the, the, the idea was, as we discussed some at our, at our organizing meeting, to recognize that there's a, there's a lot of information and there's a lot of, uh, we, we, we think, a lot of survey data lot of indicator activity data as well as a lot of perspective from uh, professionals who have been uh, thinking about and studying and organizing around issues pertaining to downtown Northampton and downtown Florence for a long time and uh, rather than pretend that we can just start from scratch 
figured out what the heck is going on. Let's let's start with a baseline of, 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 of information from from various folks who uh, have been gathering data. So the, the the flow is to start with just hearing what's out there and maybe extend that into a, 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 a second meeting as well. And then based on that, <coughs> to, to, to figure out, well, what can we as a, as a committee making recommendations to the council uh, do that would be helpful? Keep in, in my own view is in keeping in mind what uh, issues do we in fact as a city council have, jurors, have jurisdiction over and where can we actually make some 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 impact and then from there continue to hear through through public hearings what what what, what others are thinking and, and let all of that um, <clears throat> affect then what we ultimately recommend to the to the to, to the council so that was the, mm -hmm. the, the sort of the spirit of it we actually don't have times written on the agenda so um, I just noticed that Miss Beck is here and I know that she has to get somewhere else pretty soon so um, did, did, did you want to speak briefly I know we're sort of going out of order what we said we were gonna do but or were you just gonna submit oh, I can speak to it um, briefly and then give you the written copy of the is that fine is that, is that okay with everybody that, that, let her do that now since she's leaving and then yep we'll receive that's okay hey I really appreciate this I'm sorry for the conflict that came up um, so my name is Suzanne Beck I'm the executive director of the Chamber of Commerce here in Northampton and um, as you know the emergence of the downtown Northampton Association um, has created the opportunity for the chamber um, the organization that had downtown managers responsibilities for several years to kind of transition to be a partner of the DNA in focusing on downtown but I did want to share with you some of the um, information that I gathered and also give the um, also say that I really wasn't know I didn't know what you what direction you were headed or what what you were really looking for so I'm just going to give you a few um, ba an overall assessment of the downtown business environment um, and then once you once we you know work together on a more specific agenda for the inquiry then we can you know we can do we can do more on top of this but I'll start with um, we did a survey at downtown businesses in 2014 um, we had a 30 percent response rate so it was a tremendous number you know percentage of responses and either more than 90 percent of those responses were either a shop or a restaurant downtown there were very few professional services or other types of businesses that um, responded about half of them had been in business for more than 25 years and about uh, a quarter of them had been in business for less than five years so I'm just trying to give you an idea of the sample so it was a pretty good range of uh, let's just say experience as a business downtown and 45 percent of those um, participants reported a decrease in gross sales from the prior year and 22 percent reported that their sales had been flat or the same from the prior year. Slightly more than 40% reported that um, their gross sales compared to three years before were either down or the same. So those are just two statistics that I pulled out of the survey that I thought would give you at least a snapshot of the, the, you know, the competitive pressures that downtown is under and how that's affecting um, gross sales. Then I'm going to list through another another group of factors that really have nothing to do with local policies, but are more kind of external factors that play into um, business performance, if you will. Um, a big one being uh, e-commerce. I mean, we all know that that's uh, been a tremendous um, factor for retailers, in particular. Um, they're not required to collect sales taxes. The e-commerce sales are growing by double digits um, year on year and the um, in fourth quarter e-commerce sales are outpacing um, you know in-store sales by quite a few percentage points so it's a it's a factor of life now I mean e-commerce isn't going to go anywhere and there's been a fairly significant effort by the Retailer Association of Massachusetts and others to get the sales tax exemption removed but that has not received the congressional support that it would it would be needed to kind of to level the playing field. The other um, factor is what's happening with personnel and um, benefit costs, which 
are increasing a lot faster than sales. And this is really not to say that it's not making a comment on the policies. It's just a factor of it's of doing business right now um, in Massachusetts. One is the requirement for retailers to pay time and a, time and a half on Sundays. Um, you may not know that only retailers are required to do this, but that obviously affects um, overhead for those for those 52 days of the year. The impact of the increase on the min minimum wage, you know, from nine to ten, and then from ten to eleven dollars, has been another factor impacting, you know, the kind of net profit, I guess if you call it, um, for businesses. Small business health insurance premiums have been increasing 11% each year for the last two years, which compares to a 3.5% increase for large businesses. Small businesses are bearing a disproportionate amount of increased cost um, on health insurance premiums in the health care market right now for a variety of reasons. The paid time off requirement um, is another factor, the law that went into effect last year to protect um, employees and make sure that they had, they were being offered paid time off um, by that affects businesses with more than 10 employees, including seasonal employees. Again, that's another cost of business that wasn't there two years ago. And then on the horizon, there's the kind of the uncertainty about the casino and how that'll affect downtown. It's, um, you know, we, I don't think we take downtown for granted. I think we all really appreciate what we have and we recognize that this is a very unusual, um, it's unusual in New England for there to be a very successful downtown. So obviously the combination of entrepreneurship and uh, local patronage and visitor interest in downtown has contributed a lot to that success and it's just something we want to make sure that we're not um, that we continue not to take for granted. But the casino is a real wild card. Um, and, you know, the mayor's study reported that it could lead to a, a loss in sales of four to eight million dollars a year. Um, I couldn't tell you what proportion that is of sales overall, but um, it is, you know, four to eight million dollars is a large number on any, on any measure if that were in fact to be true. And then the sources for this information include the U.S. Census, the, small, uh, the Retailers Association of Massachusetts, and the Chamber's own study. And as I said, you know, I was sitting there thinking, well, then there's, you know, parking, a 500-space deficit in parking right now that, that um, according to the mayor's parking analysis, and I'm sure I'll think of other factors that are, again, part of the competitive business environment. But we're um, interested and excited to work with you on kind of clarifying the information that would be helpful and the role that the council would like to play in supporting the success of downtown. So, and thanks for the opportunity to sure. quickly say this. Thank you. Um, does anyone have a quick, super quick question for Beth before she raises off? Do you have a minute? Sure, oh, I have, yep. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's fine. I, I'm, well, I, I, I appreciate you pulled this together on very short notice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> but at a, at, a, at a more sort of qualitative and subjective level, mm -hmm. um, business is considering relocating. Uh, I, I assume occasionally at the at the chamber you, you hear from them. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just just wondering what seems to be the trends in terms of factors that the businesses from your perspective are, are, are looking at and tend to be you know, deciding factors and whether in fact to uh, locate in, in, in Northampton as opposed to the other places. Uh, well, by the time a business gets to the chamber and asks about, you know, locating here, they've done a fair amount of, you know, work on their own. But um, if we had more acreage surrounding downtown, we could have, we could have you know, brought a lot more businesses here. It's amazing how that is like all, always the top requirement they want to be, the businesses want to be downtown. So it's, you know, it's attractive to employees, it's attractive to clients, it's, um, and it's unusually uh, unusual in its uh, advantages for most business locations. Um, you know, occasionally the quality of the workforce comes up or, um, you know, the single tax factor is, is certainly uh, an advantage over communities that are, you know, you know, dividing the tax rate between commercial and residential sectors. Um, and certainly North, Northampton's reputation as a, a great place to visit and um, generally great places to visit are also places that people, um, businesses and want to invest in and people want to retire to and other people want to move from. 
So if that's any help. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for this and for coming today and for your willingness to, you know, work with us in the future. Yeah, I feel like it was yeah. a complete shot in the dark what I just gave you. So Yeah, you were very big. <laughs> we're, we're trying to hone in on this. So. Okay. Well, Thank I'm happy to, do, to work with you on that. Thanks. Thank I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so far, just to kind of catch you up, we went a little bit out of order because um, Suzanne had to, has to be somewhere at six, um, which she didn't realize. So we just heard from her since she was here. But we had just started um, going over the work plan that Councilor Bidwell had created. So I don't know if you had a chance to look at that. Um, and we're discussing you know, further how we want to structure, well, actually, maybe the first thing we should do now is we still haven't voted to accept whether or not to accept the study request. Uh, so now that you're here, um, maybe we should do that. So um, is there a motion to accept the committee study request uh, exploring issues related to the downtown economy um, that we received from the council president and council vice president. I'll, I'll, I'll make that motion. We accept the study request. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? <coughs> yeah. I, uh, I feel like I have to abstain from this vote just because I haven't been part of the discussions, unfortunately. I'm really sorry that I haven't been able to be part of them, but it just, um, I have read the minutes and they were really excellent minutes. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. Um, <coughs> I just feel like I haven't kind of picked up on the nuance, nuances of the discussion. I didn't have a chance to actually watch the meeting. So I think I just have to um, abstain from the vote. Okay. okay. Um, all right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? Abstentions. Okay. Um, so, Moving back to discussing this, um, I just read <coughs> through this, through the, the work plan. Did you get a chance to look at it? You have a, I think you have a oh, copy. Um, and uh, well, one thing again, yeah. that we we'll just put us back to, should we um, go ahead and schedule, talk about, talk about the date of that April meeting? Yeah. Um, um, just, so sort of the rough plan, Council Plan, is that uh, we have this meeting and then moving on to our April meeting, which we might come up with a different date for, because that's uh, school vacation week. Um, we will sort of go over the information that we're receiving today and, um, and then kind of talk about what each of us would like to explore further um, and then We'll, um, we'll kind of take the next step to schedule the public hearings around sort of the, the areas that we're looking to explore. Um, so, and then the next two meetings would be mostly public hearings with the idea that perhaps if we, had, if we wanted an additional public hearing, we would schedule sort of a special meeting in between there. Um, and at that June 20th meeting, uh, if we're ready, we'll discuss how to maybe you know, pull together and conclude the study um, because we have kind of a, a, a rough deadline of July for this, although I think there's some flexibility there. So we, and, and also the sort of the content of our report, I think, is not is something that we have a lot of control over. So our report could, could say this is sort of what we've looked at and this is what we want to explore further, um, or it could, we could be ready at that point to have sort of more substantive one thing about that I like is so about the sequence. Um, so whether that be April nineteenth or April twelfth, however that ends up being, I mean, I I think that um, we're we're um, we're getting data and reports, but not necessarily testimony. Um, that might be more of the qualitative data that, that we might need. Um, so for example, while we have the worker center here to give um, the presentation of the surveys that they did, they, they also have a, num a number of workers who were 
it's <clears throat> divorcing those voices right. from the um, from the hard data because we basically told them to come with the hard right. with the hard data and and wait. And so I'm wondering whether there's room for <clears throat> that's even at the next meeting. Should we mean before the public? Because that's exactly what what I'm envisioning the public hearings are for. That. Right, but they're at, but that's after we deliberate on the data and reports. We might want to deliberate. I'm saying what I'm mm -hmm. saying is it might be part of our deliberation to hear from. <coughs> yeah, know, that's I mean maybe I'm, you maybe you want to speak more to what you meant by deliberate there. I, my it, how I interpreted it was that we will sort of review what we've received already <coughs> so that we can then, you know, sort of be more specific about. How we want to structure the hearings, as a that's that's what I thought. But maybe do you, Councilor Bidwell, do you want to? Talk about? Well, I I had a, 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 a imagined, and, and maybe we're kind of talking a little bit the same thing. When I said that at the start of the of, of this April meeting was the twelfth or the nineteenth, that that we might very well realize after <coughs> today that we want to solicit additional input. Um, we might today, today deliver. We may today decide that we want to ask ask someone to come on the twelfth or nineteenth. Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. Um, yes. uh, because, in part, because they're they're, well, as as we've just seen through scheduling issues, there's some folks who, who we invited who could only be here for a few minutes today, and and, and I only said that because, uh, as I said before, that there were part of this whole there there is the crunching of the surveys and the report, but I, as I understand, there are also voices of folks who are prepared to speak. Absolutely. Right, absolutely. And, so. and, and, and in any event, to, to the extent that we deliberate along the way, it's always subject to, we're just, we're just discussing it, and it's not until we get to June that we, I would imagine that after we've had two or more public hearings that we, that we at that point, really decide, okay, this is where we as a committee recommend we can have an impact. So I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't imagine any 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 decisions prematurely as to where we think we we should we should um, try to play a role until we've um, until we've had additional input at our next monthly meeting and then two or more public hearings and along the way I think I think we I, I put it in just so we can be chewing it over a little bit along the way but but not with an expectation of really arriving at anything until after public hearings if if, if that's of help. Um, yeah, I mean, we may, as you said, we may be getting recommendations. We may get recommendations today, and we may get, you know, I mean, and those are things that we can consider, and not, you know, I mean, decide, be, be chewing over, and even start mulling over whatever might be presented before us. But today is the day that we have the hard data from Terry, and also from UMass. I don't see them here yet, but I think that they're on the way. Yeah, we told Claire six. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does that sound okay? Um, is there further discussion on sort of this path forward with this? Maybe just that we can firm up whether we want to do <coughs> meeting on the twelfth or have. We talked about maybe rescheduling the nineteenth because it's school vacation week. And I don't know if that impacts. It doesn't really impact me, but I mean, for for people who might be for people that we might all, uh, invite, or reinvite, or anything that might be <coughs> a little bit hard for them or for the chair. I mean, I know you may be impacted. Changes. Well, um, I, that day I also have transportation parking, and that's also there's also a council meeting that week, so I'm I'm around. Um, okay. But thank you for for thinking of me. Um, so that, I mean, that day is fine for me, but if other people have concerns or if we have um, concerns about other, you know, inviting um, presentations from other groups that might not be able to So it's, it, what we have is we have, we're already shifting the day from our usual Monday to a Tuesday because it's Patriots Day on the 18th. Okay. So it's whether or not we shift that to the day after Patriots Day or to the Tuesday before. And we talked about doing it at 6, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we yeah. talked about doing it at 6 o'clock if we're on the 19th. Six. Right. Yeah, oh, we talked about doing it at 6 o'clock if we're on the 19th. Or if it's, 
And so six o'clock is preferable. And it's on the 12th. Yep. As long as it's six o'clock, it's preferable. Right. Um, yeah. Well, what do we. I, 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 I'm indifferent. I, I could do either, 12th and the 19th. And the 12th works for both of you? The 12th works, yep. What? And that would be at 5 Klein six. just said, no, uh, she, the Council of Klein just said it was that 6 o'clock is it's the hour more than the day. I just have a really hard time getting get here on that. Mondays and Tuesdays, for that matter, from work at 5 o'clock. So 6 o'clock is okay for me. 6 is hard for me on Tuesdays. I, could we do 5.30? Can we try and do 5.30? That would be... That would help a little bit more possible. And what day are we talking about now? Tuesday the 12th. Councilor Bidwell, is that okay? Yes, sir. Um, okay, so 5.30 on Tuesday the 12th. Um, and in terms of, I mean, maybe at that next meeting um, would be the time to talk about whether we'd want to schedule more than the two hearings that are sort of accommodated by our normal schedule. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, so are you canceling? Or even, as we just said, we may even yeah. decide that today based on what we hear from folks. We may decide at the end of this meeting that we want to do something like that. Okay. We, we may not need to wait until then to decide whether we need more hearings. I have um, you done? Yep. two questions, and you may have covered them, and I apologize if I've missed it in the notes or maybe it wasn't in the notes, but I'm wondering if there's any um, usefulness to uh, kind of theming the two different communities <coughs> hearing the public hearings and maybe talking about um, workers and consumers mm -hmm. um, on different days so that we pull in possibly different audiences. Um, I think it could be useful to kind of pulling in more people that have an interest specific to those issues. And then the other question I had is, did you talk specifically at all about looking at um, undocumented folks who are working? Um, and did we, I know that the, um, the Worker Center can speak to that to some degree, but I'm wondering if um, it wouldn't be useful to really listen to voices to figure out if there's a representative, somebody that would actually come and speak to us along those lines, because I think that's a very, um, key workforce that we depend upon and I think they have very particular issues and needs. Um, so I just think it's something that we need to focus on with some kind of laser focus and not just kind of try and glean from some of the other things that we have scheduled. And again, I apologize if these have already been discussed. Um, yeah, to answer those, I mean, we, we had sort of discussed, I think what your, your first point was, um, and sort of my vision, which I think we were kind of sort of addressing this plan, was that each of those public hearings would, would have their own sort of um, group, constituent group to it. So roughly workers and business owners and business, you know, um, property owners. Um, and so definitely that's kind of what I had imagined. And to your second point, I had mentioned in maybe I guess in the last meeting that I was interested in for for the workers um, and and we might find that we need additional hearings which is why I wanted to have that sort of flexibility to schedule more um, but for that the the public hearing um, geared towards talking to workers issues I had said that I'd be interested in talking to um, Center for New Americans um, and Casa Latina about how to reach um, do undocumented workers or you know workers that aren't necessarily going to hear about these hearings and you know the channels that we usually and it might be a question that we could ask the worker center absolutely here now right. whether or not there's specific stuff in the in the report today but if not if there's something additional because I know that they do work with right undocumented. yeah I mean I was hoping when we were gonna 
when we sort of settled on the public hearings that we would then kind of work together to figure out how to get the word out and have as many people um, you know hear about it and participate mm -hmm. so two quick follow-up questions one um, if we were to do that I wonder if we can um, have translation services made available in some way. I don't know if you talked about that as well. You mentioned And that. then just different times of day and evening so that we can um, pull in people who work evenings, nights, versus during the day. Yeah, we'd also, we talked about that briefly too, about how to um, sort of accommodate the, you know, the, the daytime economy and the evening, um, you know, business economy and how to get those get that covered so I think that is something important to look at and another reason that maybe in particular we need at least two public hearings for workers to kind of try and cover everyone and make it as possible for people to come as we can um, so any yeah I can just add a, a, a comment the the, the, the one reservation I would have about saying that a, a, a one public hearing is for a particular group is that if it's a public hearing, anybody can come, come in and, 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 and speak. And I, I, I would just hate to get to the point where, where, where we're saying, well, I'm sorry, this is, this, this, is, this is the evening for business owners to talk, or this is the morning for uh, downtown workers to talk, or this is, this, is, this is the day for the public at large and consumers to talk. So I, I, I get a little nervous about segmenting, you know, uh, public hearings, but if it's a public hearing, we can, we can absolutely very specifically invite particular groups because we want to be sure that we, we're hearing the breadth of opinion. But I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure how much we want to segment. There's a particular hearing for a particular group. Can I respond to that specifically? Um, well, this is, a, if, if you know, I, just because this goes back to our, our I think uh, Councillor Klein made the distinction too by talking about themes rather than necessarily speakers because certainly the case can be made that there are business owners who can speak to workers issues um, and there are workers who can speak to business is issues and vice versa but having those themes I think might be a good way to to just organize a little bit to just have a better way of organizing around that. Thank you, Councillor Carney, because that is exactly the difference. I don't think that we're segmenting the population as much as themes. But I also feel like there's some merit to doing that for safety purposes, because I think there could well be workers that won't feel as comfortable speaking as um, honestly as they might want and need to if they're feeling like they're doing it in front of their employers. And so I would love to be able to Again, you know, we can't, we're not going to say, no, you can't come if you're an employer, but I think that if we have particular themes and people know that that's what we're focusing on, um, it might just help to provide a modicum of safety for people to speak mm -hmm. in ways that they'd like to. I agree, and, and maybe I sort of described it in a clumsy way, but that's exactly what I meant, is more sort of, you know, we, we often have public hearings, and, and they do have to have kind of a topic or a theme. Um, but yet, since they are public, we can't keep people from coming, and anyone's welcome to speak on them. But if we have an area that we're looking to discuss, um, I think that that's fine. And, mm -hmm. and, and I agree with you. I don't know how else to make people feel comfortable. In this thing, but. I think we, I mean, we often have public hearings that have some emotionality around the topic. I mean, we've hosted a number of those, but I think that there are particular sensitivities here um, because people's livelihoods, you know, if we want to gather good information and hear honest feedback, um, we have to think about the fact that people's livelihoods could be at stake in, in particular ways. So I, I just want us to be um, as thoughtful as we can in planning these that we try and provide that modicum of safety. Right, but with the recognition that they're completely public. Yes, um, yes, yes. Yeah, but I mean, and this might be a limitation it. of, you know, how we can, you know, have an impact on a situation in that everything we do is public. Um, right, I think you're absolutely right, and anyone can, you know, watch these or whatever, but I think there is something to be said for, you know, not sitting in the same room with someone at the same time that you're talking about something that could put you at risk. 
as opposed to, I mean, I, and we will make very clear to people that this is, you know, going to be public and so forth, so they know that when they're coming in, but it's just doing everything we can to kind of make it as comfortable as possible for people to speak honestly. I mean, I think the most important thing for me is that people really feel like they have an opportunity to be heard on issues that are affecting them. Um, so the best we can to make them feel comfortable to do that within this public realm we're in would be good. Um, any, other, any other sort of thoughts on this plan or moving forward? Is, is everyone sort of comfortable with the direction we're going in? Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I, one thing I noticed we kind of like, um, I don't know, uh, um, we basically said in this, I'm wondering whether we're doing what we said that we were going to do today, and it looks like we are. We have the city's economic development director, we have the worker center here. Um, I, is there someone in addition to the chamber today? I, I reached out to, um, to the Downtown Northampton Association and didn't hear back. My understanding is that this maybe had conferred with the chamber and one or the other was going to come. So it's unfortunate that the, you know, we had sort of a limited time with Ms. Beck, but. But this is my point. So in terms of time, really, we, we have, we have a, a sufficient amount of time now that we don't have to. We, yes, we because are. Because we have, um, and we, we know that um, there was a request to go on the on the earlier end from the yep. worker center, but we don't we don't need to feel as limited as we might have with that's absolutely true. prior to having four folks now. We yep. just have the two presentations. That's true. Okay. Did you folks discuss um, asking anyone from the former bid as well? Yeah. Well, not from the former bid, but we the re the what's now the North downtown North Hampton Hampton Association. Right, I understand that, but I just somebody that has that history maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you, no, did did you? I didn't. I mean, I think I I didn't. But um, I guess my thought is, you know, a lot of the people that are involved with the DNA had been involved, so they carry some of that history with them. <coughs> so I think we focused on where we knew there was actual data being collected right. and gathered that could be presented in a more quantitative way than necessarily the qualitative stuff that we might get from testimonies. Right, that was sort of the focus of the people who have data that's ready to go, um, that they're willing to share with us. So it didn't occur to me to contact them. Any other discussion on the work plan, action plan, what do, we, what do you want to call it? Our work plan, that's Our good work enough. Plan. Okay. Sure. And we, um, and also on this, you know, the schedule going into the future, are we comfortable kind of taking it to the next meeting in terms of further scheduling hearings and stuff like that? Yeah. Okay. So I think at the end of today, we'll, we'll also know whether we want to make some specific <coughs> requests to. Yeah, maybe we'll, since maybe we can start a little bit early with the presentations and then and a little bit early so that we have a little you know some more time to talk amongst ourselves about it but so everyone's okay with moving forward to this part okay great so um <coughs> we've got quite an audience so um thank you everyone for coming um so rose did i know that there's some time constraints so do you want to do you want to sort of set things up yeah. or sort of tell um, us who's here and I think the person oh and you have a PowerPoint right did you get that or do you need us to put it onto the thumb drive I think the person we have the time constraint I, I didn't it's have it as of 4 30 but I'll check again okay. uh -huh. but but I think you know I think <coughs> she'll show up okay um Rose, is it right? Are you? Is it right that you're waiting for someone who has the time? Um, well, there's one person who we kind of like split up the presentation okay. amongst a few different folks. So there's one person who does need to leave, so he can go, yes. and then okay. we were gonna have Jocelyn Jones, the former. Um, should I come up and? Yeah. Sure. Um, she was worked under the AG's office. Um, she's gonna say something before she heads out more. He was having a okay. time to raise. Um, and is she on the way, Rose? Um, I don't know. Can, can you text her at least? I think I have. Um, so, this one, yeah. 
Here, you can take this back. Oh. now? Um, I am going to sort of open up the discussion and then we have a worker who's going to say a few things and then um, Clay Hammonds is going to do the presentation. Great. Center and an organizer with um, Massachusetts Jobs with Justice. Um, and uh, this is my first day off the couch in about six days. I've had the flu. So um, wow. <laughs> bear with me if I sound a little like my brain is not completely working. But um, thank you so much for having us here and asking us to uh, share some of our um, quantitative research that we've done. Um, we also wanted to have a little bit of qualitative <coughs> Um, presence in our uh, presentation to you today. Um, but the Worker Center was, I'll just give you a little overview for those of you who don't know what the Worker Center is. Um, we've been in existence now for about two years um, and we came together to create a space where workers could learn about their um, rights and we around workers' rights in Massachusetts and immigrant rights and do trainings and things like that so that they can have access to those um, that information and then we would be a tool to kind of help them figure out how they can access those rights um, and again focused on low-wage and immigrant workers here in the Pioneer Valley um, and we're housed over at the James House with the Center for New Americans and the Literacy Project um, so we do work closely with them on a lot of those these issues um, and have a lot of crossover in terms of the constituencies that we're working with um, so today um, we're here to introduce um, some research that we've been working on with UMass Amherst Labor Center um, where we've produced a comprehensive report about the Northampton restaurant industry in Northampton um, and although workers have strengthened the local economy here they're facing serious exploitation um, that violates existing state and federal labor laws racism sexism and discrimination based on legal status really shape the conditions of workers in the city um, and you know we've been excited by the food justice movement locally to think about how we can source locally and sustainably, um, but we're really interested in bridging the issues of workers' rights and food justice to figure out how we create a sustainable food system so that those that are producing and growing and serving our food have just working conditions and a sustainable jobs. Um, so. Um, so the report makes specific recommendations to improve um, economic development, public health, and workplace conditions for restaurant workers. And our recommendation um, for the committee is to rec is a wage theft ordinance, which would tie um, licenses to the compliance of existing labor laws. And this ordinance would accomplish the following: create an incentive for employers to treat their workers with respect create an even playing field among businesses, raise standards across an entire entire industry, and improve conditions for all workers in Northampton. Um, and this wage theft um, ordinance that we're looking at has um, already been successfully passed in Boston and Cambridge, and is on the verge of being passed in five other cities and towns, mostly in Eastern Mass, and so here in Western Mass, we would have the opportunity to be the first to pass the wage theft ordinance um, 
and this would actually cover all workers that um, in, in Northampton and Thai licenses like food and beverage and um, permitting these types of things to compliance with wage and hour laws. Um, so um, I'm just going to just point out um, what is in your folders. Um, we have um, just an overall letter from one from our ally out in Boston, Community Labor United and the um, Boston Central Labor Council about the importance of a wage theft ordinance and overview, some samples of wage theft ordinances, and that's on the right side, and then on the left side is a comprehensive report about how employers shortchange workers and get away with it, that's the title. We then have the working paper uh, that we've put together with um, Professor Clay Hammonds at the Labor, Se Labor Center, and then um, a report on the epidemic of wage theft in residential construction in Massachusetts that was um, created by Tom Jurvich, also of the UMass Amherst Labor Center. Um, I'll, this is a letter that Representative Peter Kokot signed on to and asked that we include in this fo folder. Um, he was unable to attend today, but is a um, huge proponent of the state wage theft bill that's um, moving through the House and the Senate right now, and he just wanted to you know, send his message that he believes passing these local wage theft ordinances mm -hmm. are also incredibly important alongside this larger bill um, that's that's uh, right now in the House and the Senate. So um, those are the documents. Um, and um, the Jocelyn, on the way. On the way. Okay. So um, while we're waiting for Jocelyn, um, I'm going invi to invite up um, Jonathan Alvarez, who's a local restaurant worker. Um, we, we thought it would be important to have him sort of shape um, and talk about some of the voices that are missing from um, our report. And uh, so, are you translating? It? Okay, and, and Diana's going to translate. This is Diana. Uh, hello, my, no my name is uh, Jonathan. She uh, won translator. Okay. Um, ser lo honesto y más que pueda. I want to be as honest and as brief as possible. Y si pregunta, pues, con and if you have a question, feel free to raise those questions. So, uh, vengo aquí para hablar de, de mi experiencia este, trabajando en, en los restaurantes. I'm here today to talk to you, you about my experiences working in Northampton restaurants. Y la experiencia de mis otros compañeros. And the experiences of my uh, colleagues. Uh, cuando recién llegué acá, tuve una mala experiencia trabajando en India House. When I first arrived here, I had a very bad experience working at India House. Y es bien frustrante este, llegar a, a una experiencia de esa. And it's very frustrating to have these experiences of, of abuse. Uh, no pensé que iba a ser así, pero este, nada más vengo a decirles que, que nos apoyen en esta iniciativa que tenemos con el Centro de Trabajadores. I didn't think that my experience would be like that, and I hope that you can support the, uh, the, the labor initiative of the Pioneer Valley Worker Center. Este, Necesitamos este, una igualdad ante todo, este, que por lo menos puedan pagar el, el sueldo mínimo a todos los trabajadores, que haya este, respeto hacia los trabajadores, este, un seguro. What we need is we need equality in the workplace. We need at a very minimum that bosses comply with the minimum wage. We need respect. Um, and we need security for workers. Muchos de los trabajadores en restaurantes han tenido malas experiencias, las cuales no no quieren compartirla por el miedo a que puedan ser este despedidos de sus trabajos. Many workers have faced uh, bad working conditions, but they're too afraid. Um, they're concerned that they will be fired if they speak out. Uh, trato la manera de que ellos puedan compartir sus experiencias igual que mí, pero este, se sienten con el miedo a que puedan llegar a oídas de sus, de sus jefes y puedan ser despedidos. 
I encourage them to speak out as I am doing today, but they are afraid that what they say will be, um, will be heard by their employer and they will face retaliation. No quiero este, profundizarme más en el tema, pero si uno tiene una pregunta puede hacerla antes de retirarme. Um, I'll leave this space now. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them before I step back. Any, any questions for Jonathan? Um, have you experienced or you or your colleagues experienced retaliation when you have spoken out or been involved in the worker center? Si has, uh, si tuvo tus colegas han sido reprimidos por tu jefe por participar en el centro en este momento. Uh, normalmente no, este, hasta el momento no. Y pues espero que no vaya a pasar algo de eso. Uh, simplemente lo hago para que puedan mejorar, pero pues si algún día pasa, no sé qué va a pasar después. Um, as of now, I have not faced retaliation, and I hope that it doesn't happen. But if it does, I don't know what I would do. Eh, tal vez sí puedes, les puedes decir eh, si esta experien mala experiencia es algo común en los restaurantes para que no vayan a decir que es algo en particular. Este, para agregar un poco, na nada es en, en, en particular conmigo, también con, todo, con otro, los otros trabajadores este, ah, que han tenido tal vez este, un mal respeto, ah, les han gritado, Les han dicho algo, uh, algunas cosas uh, ofensivas. Okay. Um, he says that his, his, his particular negative experience at this one restaurant is not something specific or unique to that restaurant. It is something, a common experience of many workers who face disrespect, who are being yelled at <coughs> by their employers, or who are um, hearing derogatory remarks. So, what's the Any other questions? Um, do you have any recommendations on um, how we can create a safe place for workers to come and speak to us? Si tienes sugerencias para crear un ambiente donde los trabajadores se sientan cómodos en hablar. Uh, se puede hacer una... Uh, estamos tratando de hacer una comunidad para hablar con los trabajadores, pero es algo bien difícil porque Nadie quiere este, como exponerse y perder su trabajo por el, por el riesgo de, de luego no poder ayudar a sus familias o, o no tener um, cómo pagar su, su vivienda. Y, sí, mm -hmm. Les puedo decir eso. ¿Tú piensas que si ellos hacen una declaración que la gente no va a ser reprimida, eso le ayudaría a la gente a venir a hablar? Sería lo común. Sí. Well, he says that with the worker center, they're trying to create a community where workers can come together and share their experiences amongst themselves um, in order to combat right, this, this fear. But we, um, he's also saying that it would be useful if the council made a, a type of statement um, assuring workers that they won't face retaliation for coming forward. I think having that symbolic uh, backing would, would um, allow them to come forward. Does anyone have any questions for Jonathan? No. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Claire's gonna um, come up and then after Claire, just because we don't didn't have comprehensive data on other industries, we've focused on the restaurant industry because that's where we've kind of seen the most um, pervasive amounts of wage theft. Um, we do have folks from the Carpenters Union who are going to speak um, briefly about some of what what they see in the construction industry. Um, yeah. And I do want to just thank everyone for coming and supporting us today and I also just want to acknowledge Adam from the Green Bee and then the Roost for coming. Um, one of our high road employers in town who we really feel like we got to raise the standards so that he's not put at a competitive disadvantage with these other restaurants that are, you know, not complying with the law. So, yeah. um, is there an easy way for me to flip through some slides or do I have to tell you to flip through? Is there a button? You can try these. Can I? I'll, I'll see if that works. Thanks. <laughs> Could you just introduce yourself? Yes, I will. Thank you.
Um, so hi, my name is Claire Hammonds. Um, I work at the UMass Amherst Labor Center, um, and I also live here in Northampton. Um, and I've been involved um, working with the Worker Center for about the last two years or so. Um, and what we wanted to present to you today is a little bit of the research we've been gathering over the last two years. Um, and you know, this project really started out from an initial, some initial conversations among workers at the Worker Center who were talking about some of the real challenges that they were facing on their job. Um, they were talking about issues of wage theft and they were talking about issues of discrimination. And a lot of them were actually restaurant workers. And so with this in mind, we started to think about, okay, well, you know, we kind of know these things are happening in little pockets and we're starting to hear some stories, but what would be really helpful to have is to have some bigger picture data um, about Northampton and about the Pioneer Valley um, more broadly. You know, in Northampton, um, there's about 100 restaurants or so um, and about 1,500 restaurant workers. Um, and in this sense, you know, it's a really important economic driver for this town and for this community and it's something that really brings in a lot of people. And so I think it's a really important to sort of highlight what's going on um, within that industry. Um, so between 2014 and 2016, um, in collaboration with the Worker Center, we gathered um, about 230 surveys with restaurant workers. Um, these include workers in the front of the house who are servers and bartenders, um, as well as workers in the back of the house, um, prep cooks, dishwashers, um, line cooks. Um, and we really sort of got a, a broad range. Um, and in addition to that, we also did um, about 22 in-depth interviews with workers, talking more sort of about um, sort of day-to-day -day experiences on the job. Um, and you know, what we actually found, I think, is that you know, restaurants in Northampton, and this is similar to rest findings about restaurants across the country, um, you know, there really is a, it's a sort of sustaining a low-wage industry where workers enjoy very low wages, few benefits, um, issues around wage theft are pretty rampant. Um, and we just kind of wanted to, to raise up some of those issues um, and also to start to think about what are some solutions that we can come together as a community. Because I think, um, as Rose highlighted, there already are a number of cities that are trying to move forward types of ordinances that address these issues. Can I, can uh, I just, can I just have to like, sure. I feel like we've talked, we've mentioned wage theft many times, but I'm not sure it's been defined yet, just for you know, people okay. who don't know what it is. I, um, so I, I have a slide. Let me see if I can. Sorry if I'm. No, 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 no. I, you know, that is, that's like the most important question, right? So for, that we can take. How do I? To the left side. Left, left hand. Left side. Oh. Left, yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Can I jump ahead? Boy. Okay. I will skip this and just, uh, I will just talk briefly. So wage theft is when workers aren't getting the full amount that they're owed, right? That they're owed for work that they've completed. Um, and it happens in a number of different ways. Um, one way is simply employers failing to pay the minimum wage. And that's probably the least common um, of the kinds of wage theft that we're talking about. Um, but that really does happen. Um, we've seen examples of workers who are employed um, where they receive an, um, a either weekly or monthly wage rate um, and then are oftentimes working you know, in, in excess of 60 hours such that their wage that they end up being paid per hour is less than the minimum wage. Um, the other ways in which it happens is that employers fail to um, pay overtime um, and certainly within the restaurant industry we find that this is a, a really common problem. Most, um, most of the workers we talked to did not receive overtime pay. Um, the other thing is employees not being totally compensated for shifts that they work. So this includes doing some work before or after your shift in which you're not paid. Um, we found that about one in five workers talked about working off the clock at some point. Um, and the other way in which this happens, and this is particularly a problem among tipped workers, um, tipped workers who are paid at the special tipped minimum wage of $3.35 an hour, um, being asked to do substantial amounts of side work or other work, um, and being paid at the tipped wage rate as opposed to the actual minimum wage rate. Um, so the, the the law is that if you're at any if you're doing more than twenty percent more than twenty percent of your work is um, you're not receiving tips during that time, then you are entitled to be paid the regular minimum wage. Um, and 
some employers do that, but it's it's really spotty to keep track of. It's difficult for employees to keep track of. It's difficult for employers to keep track of. And because it varies from day to day, it can be a real problem. Um, so those are just sort of a number of ways in which you see that happening. But generally speaking, when we're talking about wage theft, we're talking about workers not getting paid for the amount that they've worked. Um, <coughs> So I'll just say just one or two things about the sort of methodology of this survey, or the methodology of this study as a whole, because we used a couple of different pieces of information. Um, as I m mentioned, we did um, the face-to-face -face surveys. The survey is about 100 questions. Um, it takes about 20 minutes or so to complete, um, and it includes a range of things about hours, working conditions, um, experiences with um, discrimination on the job, experiences of health and safety. Um, and then also ask a number of sort of demographic questions about you know people's living situations, people's travel situations, et cetera. Um, the other thing we included in-depth interviews, and I think this really provides an important backdrop to um, to the data that's coming out of the survey. Um, and then finally, we also drew on government data. <coughs> so particularly, we used the American Community Survey, which is um, a, a economic survey that's done um, every year that creates a sort of profile of. Um, of community members. We also use data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, in order to provide sort of a bigger picture of what the restaurant industry looks like, not just in Northampton, but also thinking sort of more broadly through the Pioneer Valley, what that looks like. Um, so, just say a couple things. Um, just actually sort of taking a bigger picture out about the, oh my goodness, that is so small. I apologize. <laughs> uh, I will give you a couple of the key highlights. Um, and you can also find that the chart is actually in your packet if you wanted to look at it more carefully. Um, so what you're looking at here is actually a comparison of um, restaurant workers. Sorry, before you get into it, Jack's here, so we should just have it. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, um, Jocelyn is here who needs to like step out quickly, so. Okay. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt the flow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, good evening, counselors. Um, my name is Jocelyn Jones. Um, I work for the law firm Siegel Roitman, a labor and employment firm in Boston, and I am the Northampton outpost of the firm. Um, I'm glad to be here to speak um, on behalf of the, I mean, in support of the Pioneer Valley Worker Center's efforts um, and the collective efforts of workers in this region. Um, I had been the deputy chief of the Fair Labor Division in the Attorney General's office for the past eight and a half years. I just left my position about four months ago, and prior to that had been an assistant attorney general in the Fair Labor Division. Um, so for a total of 15 years, my, my entire legal practice was focused on wage and hour issues. Um, a lot of what we in the Attorney General's office, when, when I say we, I'm going to be talking about the, the past, but this includes I know the Attorney General, Maury Healy, who's going to be nearby in just a, in a few minutes, um, ha has a real commitment to wage and hour enforcement. And one of the, the keys is having partners, um, not only in the private sector, like the Pioneer Valley Worker Center and other unions and interfaith organizations, but also having um, partners in government. <clears throat> We've worked um, in tirelessly to build a commitment from um, municipalities and towns in the state to work collaboratively, establish a task force on an employee on employee misclassification and the underground economy. And the underground economy is something that sort of strikes at the heart of what sort of creates an unlevel playing field for for honest, good, um, good, law-abiding businesses like the many in Northampton, and also really subjugates and exploits workers. Um, it's something that really, not in addition to those two bad things for the economy, it, it plunders the tax base of many um, cities and towns and the state. There have been a lot of reports that have shown the effects of the underground economy on the on deteriorating economic um, indicators. And in the, uh, the misclassification task force, which had a huge focus on wage thefts and non-payment of wages, which is just another way of saying wage theft, um, we, we had recovered millions of dollars in unpaid wages. The restaurant industry was absolutely one of the biggest um, targets because that was really where a lot of the complaints were coming from. We get a lot from construction, we get a lot from a lot of other industries, but Restaurants happen to be um, ones that had, you know, long hours, people not getting proper 
overtime, proper pay, getting exploited, being um, you know trafficked, and that remains, I know, the f one of the focuses of the Attorney General's office and the Department of Labor. And when I was in the a the office, and I speak to four months ago, and you know before. We, um, and I know this has continued, uh, really wanted to create partnerships and help other states, um, state entities and the like municipalities put teeth into the laws that exist out there. Um, the task force focused on the alcohol and beverage um, control, um, uh, I'm forgetting the last name, but uh, um, the, the commission that, is, that regulates al alcohol and beverage. Um, and building and all different kinds of permitting to sort of ensure that the, the op those who are operating it within their um, jurisdiction were abiding by the laws. The people they were giving um, permits to or giving some sort of other privilege to were actually treating the workers and the people, the residents, the citizens um, of the town, treating them fairly and not undermining the competition of their you know, fellow competitors. Um, one of the things we were doing was working with the city of Boston. Um, Mayor, Mayor Walsh came in and had a really strong sort of um, a strong and well supported um, priority in, in making sure that the city of Boston was doing everything it could do to help workers from being the victim of subjugation at the sort of at the where the taxpayers have, have some sort of a stake and that's giving out permits, etc. Um, so there was a, they created their own enforcement of wage theft that is not, it's not the city doing the enforcement, it's the city helping to support the workers who come forward um, to help coordinate, like coordinate um, the passing along of information to the proper agencies, to the AG's office, etc. So we helped talk through a lot of the, and work on a lot of the ordinances that have come to be, the Chelsea um, committee, Ch Chelsea just passed their ordinance the other night, it was signed by the city manager, city of Boston. Um, there are a number of others that had been coming to us and getting some help in trying to understand how the how they can do work to support the workers and the the law-abiding businesses in their local economies um, from the attorney general's office. And there's both the municipal law unit that helps to answer some of the questions, and also the fair labor division that has a lot of the outreach. Um, partnership sort of goals that I think are being reflected here by the um, presence of so many different players and um, I don't have I don't have I, I don't have enough time to talk anymore but I appreciate being heard and interrupting Claire thank you very much <laughs> um, do you all have any questions for me um, and if you have any at a later date um, I'd be happy to come um, address them or respond to emails or whatnot um, Actually, our economic um, development director has a, looks like he has a quick question. Okay. Um, the issue you define is extremely important, mm -hmm. um, and I think that it would be very helpful for the continuation of the conversation mm -hmm. to bring in other stakeholders who can start to define exactly the economics of operating a retail restaurant, so to, 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 to give further evidence to the legitimacy of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, too often, the conversation is segmented in many ways, and I think we need to see what the actual overhead costs for a normal routine restaurant business could be, mm -hmm. because I also think that's a subliminal way of starting to send a message mm -hmm. to business owners that they need to rethink the model and the paradigm mm -hmm. of their economic payroll model mm -hmm. trying to sustain the business. And if they sense that that's an alarm bell, then that starts a conversation with their building owners and their other mm -hmm. uh, people that they do business with to say, in essence, we have to change the way we're modeling this. I don't know if I'm making any sense. I, absolutely. It. No, it's great. And there are a lot of different ways to approach tackling the, the issue and getting good businesses who care about both their reputation and serving the community well and their workers is, is an important part of it. As an aside, I've made it a, a cottage industry to actually start emailing out reporters who do stories on the living wage mm -hmm. because they are never ever reporting what the the revenues, incomes, and operating expenses of some of these businesses are mm -hmm. because they know either they're doing it deliberately or inadvertently, 
but they know that if they do, then the argument for a living wage becomes more viable, mm -hmm. whereas right now it's just a he said, she said argument where the reporter writes the story and says, here's a movement that says we have a living wage, and then they go quote the, the local business organization that says, oh, it's terrible, we can't afford it, make it right, go away. Right, right. And then, of course, then Fortune Magazine does a huge audit of Walmart mm -hmm. and says that they could easily afford to pay those wages and not put much of a dent in their profits. So right, again, right. it's a specificity because mm -hmm. there will be businesses that will be able to stand up and mm -hmm. say, hey, if this happens, mm -hmm. it's going to change my, my model, my budget. And I mm -hmm. think there's a valid argument. That argument needs to come forward and be specific mm -hmm. so we all can have an airing of an issue. I don't right. know if that makes sense, but that's. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Okay. I know you have to go. Do you have a card or a way to um, do I will. Um, I think Rose has has my um, all of my that. contact information. Okay. Maureen um, has that as well, um, and I don't have a card with me. Okay. I apologize. Okay. And right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. <coughs> have a good evening. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, so um, we're going to go to I'll finish with a couple of the things I wanted to say, and I won't take too much more time because um, you do have some of the the data in front of you. Um, but I think, you know, coming back to this issue of workers, I think, you know, um, it is absolutely right that it is um, very much tangled up in, in issues with lots of other stakeholders, um, including employers. And certainly, um, I think um, one of the pieces that we recommend sort of at the end of this report is thinking about how do we really um, hold up and raise up um, employers who are, who are doing the right thing and make sure that we're able to support those businesses um, over time. Um, so, so jumping back in, I'll just quickly give you um, a little bit of a, a brief overview when we're thinking about restaurant workers sort of in the Pioneer Valley more broadly. Um, and I know that you can't actually see any of these numbers, but if you could, what it would show. Uh, uh, no, it's okay. I'm just going to give a, a basic um, sort of framework of it, which is to say that, you know, the restaurant industry. Um, and what you see highlighted here is really that it's an important source of jobs um, for some of the most marginalized workers and also for workers who are really starting to enter the workforce either um, through immigration or because um, they're younger workers. Um, the, the workforce is um, about 57% female. Um, and of course, there are splits within the occupations, right? If we look at jobs like servers, servers are overwhelmingly female, about 83% of servers um, in between Hampshire, Hamden, and Franklin County um, are women. We also find that if we look at the age of restaurant workers, it tends to be a little bit lower than if we look at workers in all other industries. There's about 45% um, or so of workers are between the ages of 16 and 24. Um, and you know, I think it's also important then to sort of keep in mind that really about half of the workers in this industry are, are over 25, right? So these are people who are often in careers for a long time. Um, and I think it's important to sort of continue to paint that picture. Um, and you'd also see, I have some demographic information up here about education of restaurant workers. It tends to be um, slightly less skilled, and in that way it really is an important entry point to the labor market um, for lots of different kinds of workers. Um, what I have up here is actually looking at the average and median wages for restaurant occupations. Um, and I highlight this primarily because um, what you find is the across the board food um, preparation and serving occupations are some of the lowest paying jobs, not just in our um, in Northampton, but really sort of in our community more broadly. Um, in comparison, to, if we look at sort of all occupations, the hour me median wage um, sort of in the Springfield metro area, which is the, um, the metro area that we use for, for census data, they sort of have strange boundaries of how they count things, um, is about $22 an hour. Um, and if we look at just food preparation <coughs> jobs, um, it's about ten ninety five an hour, right? So we're looking at less than half. And so I think it's important to sort of keep in mind that this is an industry that really does rely on having very low wages across the board um, for workers. Um, so the survey we did, as I said, we had about 235 respondents. Um, and we really tried to break this out so that we had some who were in fine dining kinds of restaurants. We had some that are in family style. So that's sort of like a more sit down, casual kind of restaurant. Um, we had some that in quick service, so that includes, um, you know, t uh, you know, like takeout kinds of places. 
Um, we also tried to get a pretty broad swath in terms of um, race, um, thinking a little bit about having, making sure that um, we have uh, uh, a sort of a broader range of workers represented. Um, <clears throat> And also sort of breaking that down in terms of age, because I think the experience of workers really does vary. Um, so just talking a little bit about findings. Um, I just wanted to start out with a, a quote, actually. It came from one of our interviews. Um, it was from um, a barista. His name is J uh, Jack, although I did change his name. But his name could be Jack. Um, <laughs> so he's about 25, and he says, um, I wish that employers would pay their workers a consistent living wage instead of having a tip jar out in front and inspecting customers to subsidize the workers' wages for them. And this was a sentiment we heard sort of time and time again, not just with workers who work in a place where there's a tip jar, but certainly among other kinds of tips workers, feeling like they're so reliant on the customers to be subsidizing their wages. Um, and so in our survey across the board, the, um, for all job categories we looked at, um, workers we reported to worked about an average of 32 hours a week um, and took home about an average of $380. Um, in general, we found that 78% of the workers surveyed made less than what we, um, is considered the, um, the living wage for Northampton, so that's, which is $13.18 an hour. Right? So a huge portion of these workers, more than three quarters, are, re are really making less than a minimum wage. Um, is that 380 before taxes? You think? No, no, no. That's after taxes. Okay, so that's what. That's like. Net, yep. Net that's payment. what they take home in their paycheck. Or yes. it's actually, I mean, yeah. Well, after in their yeah, they get paid out in different ways. But okay. yes, that's after taxes. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we also had a, a number of incidents of, of back of the house workers who were reporting that they were being paid um, weekly or even monthly flat wages, um, and then were being working sort of huge numbers of hours. Um, okay. <laughs> um, benefits. Um, this is actually a quote from a, a bartender um, in town, and you know, he's 34, he's been doing this for quite a while, and he you know, is in a position of starting to think about his future, and this is, you know, a career for him, but he's thinking about um, what does it mean to be in this position where there are no benefits. And he said, we don't have medical, we don't have 401k, we don't have a pension, we don't have anything that takes care of us or a safety net. We have to make sure there's a nest egg or that we take care of ourselves. And a lot of people in the service industry live paycheck to paycheck, so it's scary. If I get sick, I still have to work. If I get hurt, I still have to work. I can't afford to take time off in order to, you know, and that's just not fair to people. And what he was describing, I think, is pretty widespread. Um, you know, benefits are really non-existent um, <clears throat> in the restaurant industry. Um, we were talked to almost no workers who received health insurance. That was pretty rare. Um, about um, about 22 percent of the work, many of them received health insurance through um, the, uh, a family member, um, so they did have health insurance. Um, and but we found about 22% of um, restaurant workers that we surveyed were, um, were using um, state subsidized mass, mass health um, as their primary form of health care. Um, about 95% of workers said they didn't get paid sick days, 95% said they didn't get vacation days, and about 85% 80 said they had worked when they're sick. Now obviously we know that in 2014, Massachusetts passed earned sick time. Um, and for larger restaurants, places that have an excess of 11 employees, this will have an impact in terms of giving employee, employees access to 40 hours of um, paid sick leave a year. But I think one of the things is that employees themselves aren't totally sure of how this law works. I think there's not even enough information for employers around how this law works and how they can start to implement it. So, so compliance is, it still continues to be a major problem, even though we have this legislation. Um, I'm, just, I'm just being cognizant of the time, so um, I will I will go quickly. Okay, because Have, there's also I mean there's someone else that you'd like to have to speak after. You. Uh, yes. Who do we want? Who's speaking after? In the car. Okay. Uh, wait, two. Quick. Okay. So yeah, yeah that it makes it two. Yeah. Cause, okay. Cause okay. Yeah. I will. We'll do two more minutes. Okay, that would be great. Just because we have another hundred percent. Also, after you guys. Um, this okay, sure. Um, 
So this is just coming back to the issues of wage theft, and I sort of outlined for you before a number of wages they happen. About 65% of people we talked to hadn't received any overtime pay and weren't even aware if they were um, eligible for overtime pay. Um, and really about one in five people we were talking to um, had worked on the clock in the past 12 months um, without um, receiving pay at all for that time. Um, health and safety obviously is a huge issue in the restaurant industry. Um, uh, very few ac workers actually have um, some sort of formal training from their employer and people are working in hot kitchens with sharp knives um, and it's really not uncommon for workers to be actually hurt on the job in a variety of ways um, and to really be sort of suffering through that. Um, and I just had this great quote from this um, restaurant worker, John, who sort of talks about what it's like to actually get burned in the kitchen and that you just sort of, you get used to it because kitchens are just so hot and you just move so fast that that's just, that's just part of that work. Um, <clears throat> One. Um, the, the next slide I would have showed you was just a, oh, some brief outlines about discrimination. This is something that really comes up for a lot of employees, um, particularly issues around discrimination related to gender and also um, related to, um, to race, ethnicity, and immigration status. Um, and that's sort of a, pro a widespread problem that really limits the ability of workers to sort of improve their, um, their jobs within the restaurant industry. Um, and finally, I just highlight for you, and you can see this in your in your packet as well, just a number of sort of key policy recommendations, thinking about sort of strengthening enforcement of laws that exist on the books, um, using opportunities to create public awareness and enhance recognition for um, for responsible employers, and also importantly, as we've started to talk about a wage theft ordinance, to think about how we might implement some sort of system for flagging businesses to which the city is actually issuing permits that are wage theft violators, right? So how do we make sure that, that permits aren't going to employers that have been shown to be in violation of state, federal, state or federal um, labor employment laws? Um, we'll wrap it up for you there. Um, Thank you. Any questions? Anyone have any quick questions for Claire? Will we move on? Um, just um, if, uh, if we have time at, at subsequent uh, hearings and meetings since this one's so short you might be able to come back I can talk about this all day okay. <laughs> well, okay, and, and the time. Kim, you can make this PowerPoint available to all of us right mm -hmm. okay so we'll, we'll be able to Great. see all that stuff thank you thank you very much um, Mr. Dennis yes. this is the uh, this is the second time I think I've addressed this chamber, and I think both of the times, now the second time, I'll begin the same way I began it the last time, which was that this is very complicated, in my opinion. Um, I wasn't, didn't know if I was going to say anything, so I jotted down some notes on my phone just now, so I apologize for reading from my phone. Did you just introduce yourself? Yes. First thing that I say oh, right here. No, I'm sorry, that was my little intro, not even. Now, uh, my name is Adam Dunnitz. I own the Green Bean and the Roost restaurants here in Northampton. I want to say first that this is not an easy business for anybody, I don't think. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for all of my restaurant colleagues. No one goes into the restaurant business to get rich. It's hard work for all of us. Um, I really uh, also admire the work that uh, the Worker Center is doing. Um, I don't know that I'd say that I agree with every single position of theirs, but I think that I probably agree with most of them. Um, but I'm really glad that they're there. Um, while I really have no idea what goes on in other restaurants, I can say that I personally endeavor to follow all the employment and wage laws that I'm aware of, and I'm sure that I don't always get it right. It's been a learning process for the last eight plus years. But aside from the paralyzing fear that grips me at the thought that I might be doing something wrong or illegally, the even greater force that drives me and how I try to run my businesses is that I want to be able to sleep well every night knowing that I'm doing the best that I can for my employees. That's been a clear and consistent goal of mine since I opened the Green Bean in December of 2007 and it hasn't changed. For whatever it's worth, I'd like to offer that I believe it is possible to follow all wage and employment laws and also run a sustainable business. That's been my experience. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. And we hope that maybe you'll come back at another point as we go through this process to 
maybe just a quick, quick question. So, um, um, when you're when you hear about uh, some of the of your competitors who um, may be in violation of wage and hour laws, um, I don't really hear about it. Except when I visit with my friends over at the worker center, that you know they don't give me specifics, but I have been shocked t to learn that people, you know, there's other restaurants in town that hire people that are are not legally allowed to work in the United States or pay them below minimum wage. Um, to me, I don't even like I I don't. That's not a reality for me, and I uh, am surprised to learn that it's a reality in other businesses. But I really have no idea what's going on in other businesses. I, I you know, my day to day is pretty much 100% of my own places. Um, uh, Claire made the, the point earlier that more needs to be done to, to hold up businesses that, that, that behave ethically, responsibly, uh, responsibly, lawfully, like, like like yourself. Do you do you feel that you're it's understood that uh, you behave? professionally the way that you do and are you appreciated for it and how could you be how would you feel you could be better recognized by the community for being a, uh, uh, an example of a business owner that plays by all the rules that's a great question um, I'm not a I, I uh, how do I put it <clears throat> I think that I, my personal theory about how this works for me is that there's like a triangle where there's no top. There's the employers, there's the people that work at the businesses, and there's the customers. And I feel like um, if not every one of those groups is doing well by that business, then I don't think that anyone is. I don't think the business is working. And so my feeling about it is that like, I don't have a good job if I'm not providing good jobs and a good product. And I guess the way that I live my own life and run my own businesses is that I, I, I call it from the inside out, um, meaning that I don't put a lot of stock um, in having external recognition or stickers on my door that tells the world what I'm doing. I feel like if I'm doing what I'm doing well, which means that all three of those parts of the pyramid are doing well by the business, then I feel like that um, is the most powerful thing that I could achieve and I feel like that that speaks volumes is, is I think that how I see it I don't know if I'm necessarily against it um, but uh, like I said it, it's complicated and I, I I have a tremendous amount of respect for anyone that gets in this line of work because it's not easy so I understand that people are doing what they can to make it work so um, yeah okay. thank you very much yeah thank you Okay, so we're very, very, oh, Mr. Mouse, can, can I say something to what Adam had to say? Uh, yeah, if it's brief, because I want to make sure I get to your presentation, so. Um, there's an article in the Richmond Times-Dispatch today about how mall, shopping malls are continuing to lose money, and the retail mixes of the businesses in the malls are being changed to calibrate to the fact that the bigger boxes are leaving, but the article also pointed out that it's doing it because the country's getting poorer. And the article made the, made the statement from one of the interviewees that in 2007, the poverty rate was one out of 12 people, and now it's one in eight. And it's basically climbed up to a greater degree. And that's now impacting the retail composition of our economy. And my other point to make is that as we watch <coughs> other jobs in this country being offshored and taken away and hollowed out, these service jobs are becoming more and more important because for many people they are real jobs. They're not a transitional job. It's not a part-time job. It's not a job you have when you're retired. These are people that this is this is their, their way of life. And for many regions, that is something that they we've got to face. So it's critical that these jobs have a economic foundation and, and an organized structure to them so that people do get a decent wage and access important benefits, whether that's directly through the employer or maybe that's too much, maybe it's done on a, on a higher level and a more of a broader consortium, but I just wanted to make the point that these service jobs, given the direction that our economy is headed right now, <coughs> it's, it, these are real jobs for people and, and I, I see it and I think it's worth sharing and I think you do as well, but I just want to make the point. Thank you. Okay, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, 
My name is Manny Gines. I am a lead organizer for the New England Regional Council of Carpenters. Uh, I represent right here in this area, uh, local 108, 20 union con contractors and 80, 881 uh, total members. Now, <clears throat> the issue that I'm gonna speak about doesn't pertain to union and non-union, just fair, uh, way of uh, living a, a livable wage and, and not being exploited or taken advantage of where we, we were talking about wage theft with the restaurants, construction falls in many other ways also. And wage theft is literally don't get paid at all for the work that you do. These guys you literally go to work and work for a contractor for a couple of months in the end of the project, the contractor says he didn't get paid. You gotta wait, you didn't get paid, you gotta wait. And they wait literally four or five weeks, six weeks. I have seen it even longer. And then he just takes off on them and don't pay them at all. <clears throat> as far as overtime, they don't even bother about asking for overtime. And they work from sun up to sun down. Uh, for another example, I had a guy who came to me and to complain about a contractor who was literally charging him to train him, and uh, he wasn't a, he didn't have an apprenticeship program or nothing, but he was charging him <clears throat> for the training to make him a taper. He paid him six hundred dollars for two weeks' pay, month working Monday to Saturday, 10 hours every day. When you do the math, you wind up paying them six, $6.25 an hour, <clears throat> which is under the minimum wage. So <clears throat> I'm here to talk about wage theft in construction. Uh, the lady that spoke here earlier, Jocelyn Jones, that used to work in the Attorney General's office, I worked with her very closely. And I just want to share a story with you about uh, something that I worked with her on and you can, when you ever talk to her again, and she'll verify it. Uh, contractor named uh, Matt Interiors, owner Jack Goulet, had a worker who was working for him, <clears throat> undocumented worker, who was paying him $15 an hour, and they were working in an area in, in, a, in a strip mall where there was a lot of projects going on at the same time. So another contractor noticed that this guy was doing a dome and taping. And it's, you, you gotta be good to be able to do that with no, you know, nice and smooth. And he was doing a great job. So that contractor came over to him and asked him how much was he making there? So he told him $15 an hour. So the contractor told him, come with me, I'll pay you 25. So, he, he wanted to go with that contractor, but when he went to, because this guy was a church going guy and everything, and he appreciated that the guy kept him employed for a couple of years that he worked for him for $15 an hour. And he went to tell him that he was gonna give him two weeks notice, or if he can meet, meet uh, match the, the offer that the other contractor gave him, he'll stay with him. The guy told him, you can't leave nowhere, you're going to work for me, you go work for somebody else, I'll kill you, and literally threatened him like that. So somebody gave him my number and told him to call me that I can help him. He called me when he told me that, I couldn't even believe he was telling me that, so I told him, this is America, you go work for whoever you want to work, and this guy's going to pay you $10 more an hour, <laughs> but with you, I'll go work for him. So he was afraid because he was undocumented and the guy literally had beat up people before his employees. So I told him, look, if you're really afraid of the guy, go to the police station and file a complaint against him and get, get a restraining order. He, he didn't take my advice and just went to work for the, uh, for the other contractor. And the contractor did go to the job site, met him there at 6.30 in the morning, slapped him around, kicked him while he was on the ground. And the two weeks that he, that he, he had owed him, he didn't even ask for that money. So he didn't pay him for two weeks, plus beat him up. 
and <clears throat> he called me, cops got involved, I got Jocelyn Jones involved. Uh, the bottom of the story, I don't know how it happened, somebody called ice on him, they knocked on his door, took him, put him in, in jail for immigration, and the bottom line of the story, he got cheated for two weeks of pay and beat up and then thrown in jail. <clears throat> and that's what we that's what we're having we're facing here with the underground economy. I just want to go real quick and bring some numbers so catch your attention why it's important for us and, and municipalities and taxpayers to worry about this. America underground economy consists of an estimate of two trillion of un, <clears throat> unreported income. In construction, this takes form of misclassification of employees as independent contractors or paid in cash. <clears throat> construction misclassification could range up to one, one in four, which is 24% of Massachusetts construction employers. These are uh, numbers that I'm reading out is from a study from Harford Construction Policy Research. 103.6 to 187.1 million loss to the state in unreported income tax and unemployment insurance tax from 2001 to 2003. Ninety-one million loss in insurance carriers and workers' compensation premiums. For every dollar spent in enforcement in 2013, eight dollars and thirty-six cents was returned to the state economy. <clears throat> so now wage theft here in Northampton. <clears throat> I didn't have too much time to prepare. I probably would have had more cases to bring for it. But uh, right here, I personally, and my partner there, Charlie Payne, who is a, a member of Local 108, did a job site here at uh, Christopher Heights. They got a TIF for uh, 213, uh, $100,000 in tax relief and uh, <clears throat> over 15 years and low income housing taxes credit and mass housing community development. The general contractor was the GC, Color Associates, who has a notorious record of what I was just speaking about. Hiring contractors who operate and, and, and use this as a, a model of business. And the, the subcontractor was CDC Drywall, who subbed to Landers Drywall. So the water contractor who bits on the job, he bits on the job and then he really literally don't even do no work at the job. He'll so give I'm it to- sorry, we're really running out of time. Is there, is there any way you can make these numbers available to us? Sure, there's a study with, with Hartford. I'll get it, I'll, I'll get it be, for you and- uh, great. Yeah. And there's also something on uh, United Brotherhood of Carpenters payroll fraud. Okay. If you Google that, you know, and that talks nationwide with the situation and the problems that we're facing. Thank you. I mean, yes. just specifically, you, I mean, you, you wrapped, it, wrapped it up getting to the one local case, but if we have questions about the Christopher Heights project specifically, since Yes, and I, I have that, affidavits and everything from workers who are working there who okay. then paid them cash. Thank you. Okay, clearly right? there's Hey, so much more of this conversation to be had, so yeah. I, I'm sorry to have to cut you off. It's okay, and thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you, everyone who came from the Pioneer Valley Worker Center um, and the UMass Labor Center today. There's, as I said, there's obviously a lot more to talk about, so thank you, and, and uh, we hope that you'll stay involved with us in this conversation as we go through this Pioneer Center Festival.
Thank you. Sorry, we're uh, you guys are a long time waiting, so thank you. Um, and we, it, we may have to go a little bit over where we're not actually bound to end at seven, because that's not on the agenda. Thank you. I want to make sure we're spreading this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to rely on Pam to move. Um, <coughs> what we, um, no, oh, there it is. Yeah. Do you want to do it yourself or do you want to do it? I can do it. Yeah, right, we're close to the door. First um, tab is who's here, um, business inventory. So, sorry, could you just sort of set up what we're, first of all, introduce yourself, please, and um, set up what we're looking at, because this was just, this, what, you're, what you're talking about now has just been launched, right? Correct. Um, my name's Terry Masterson, and I'm the Economic Development Director for the city of Northampton. Um, this is an attempt to start, this is just the beginning, of an attempt to do what goes on in many counties um, in which you measure the real estate activity that goes on in the downtown. And that, in essence, becomes evidence for what the economic activity um, could be or is. Um, and what we're trying to do is to measure how many businesses are here, what kinds of businesses are in the downtown, um, what is the mix, um, try to measure the cost of doing business in the downtown in terms of rent and building values because there has been a lot of conversation about whether rents are at market, below market, or above market. Um, so this is an attempt to start to factually fill in the blanks on that, that conversation. Um, and from rents, you translate over to what's the value of the properties in downtown. And anecdotally, we can all bump into people who feel that buildings in the downtown are either at market, above market, or below market. Everyone has their own perspective. I think it might be a good idea to start to actually take buildings and measure them against other buildings and other retail markets to see how we stand com in comparison to them. So under the retail rents and building values tab, you'll see that when we get there that We've tried to compare buildings to Amherst and to, I chose Middletown, Connecticut, because Middletown, Connecticut is a community that has Middlesex Community College and Wesleyan University right there in the downtown. They have a terrific linear main street um, that is full of the same type of buildings that are in our downtown, so I'm not trying to compare apples to oranges. They've got entertainment, they've got restaurants, they've got probably more office space than we do. They've got some really upscale buildings, and then they've got some Class B and Class C properties as well. So I think it's an interesting denominator there. Um, key local revenues, I, we'll get to that tab. That is meals tax and hotel tax. Uh, and we put parking revenue in too to try to show those, particularly meals tax and hotel tax are interesting taxes because they're measured per capita. They're measured by uh, in a consumer paying three quarters of one percent in meals tax on their meal to the state that's measured by the state and the city and then hotel tax is measured by um, say measurement of, of taking an occupancy in a hotel room and paying a share of that in a tax by multiplying those tax dollars out in certain ways you can you can start to predict what foot traffic is visitorship is to the downtown and as we get to those numbers we'll see that those numbers have been flat that's an interesting thing to know in terms of the conversation of the cost of doing business and whether the market can absorb higher rent, lower rents, or stable rents if you're, if you're dealing with a situation where your revenues are, are plateauing and they're not increasing, then it's just, it's just another fact to think about. Attendance figures and estimates, we'll, we'll get into that as well to try to measure um, who's coming here. Um, so I'll quickly get into it. Um, 
we have 190 retail businesses in the downtown, um, 33 eating establishments, 8 tea and coffee, 7 dessert and sweet shops, 12 bars, 5 music and entertainment venues, which is very impressive, 17 clothing stores, 10 specialty unique item gifts type sh stores, 7 jewelry, 6 bookstores, 5 art galleries, 4 banks, 2 food market stores, um, 3 body art stores, I think that number is low, there's more, um, 4 fitness or yoga establishments, 3 computer, 4 antiques, 10 hair salons and barber shops. 31% um, of all the stores in downtown are related to food and beverage which is a, a percentage I think is consistent with some other downtowns. Um, in that, a vast majority of those stores are locally owned. I think we counted anecdotally maybe eight or nine national brand uh, retailers um, in the downtown, and I think that's positive. Um, what other statistic do I have there? I'm estimating, and I think we need to firm the number up that we have, about 200,000 square feet of retail space, and we'll eventually get a more accurate number um, when we go to that and get further down the road with this, but at least it's the start of the conversation. So 100, and, yes? It's downtown Northampton. Correct. Not and not Florence. And this is not Florence. And let me say that the boundary lines are the Smith College gate at Elm and West Street. Going north, the northern reach is Center Street and then going up King Street, it's King Street up to Allen Street, uh, Allen Lane, excuse me. The, the eastern boundary is Market and Hawley Street, where um, right past the railroad tracks, and the southern boundary is Pleasant going down to Holyoke Street. So this is just downtown Northampton? Just downtown. Yeah. Um, so does it include, so it includes both sides of say Holly or Market Street, and that, but not like the post office or the businesses that are. I did. I didn't go into. I didn't go past the antique store. I, I okay. stuck with Holly and Market. Um, I mean, you have another little shopping plaza. We could include that, but for this, I did not. Um, and so, also in the north boundary, um, you don't go all the way up to the to include like River Valley. It, 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 it ends. The north boundary is Center and King Street. And I, Allen, oh, Allen Place is right there at that Shelburne Falls Coffee. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, um, we list here uh, business openings. So frozen. So we had business openings, we had um, Pure Bar in Northampton, the blue marble and went into Thorns, the Green Earth Computer went to Crafts Avenue, um, the, the Juice Bar went into Thorns, um, Bombay Royale just opened up at One Roundhouse Plaza, Edwards Jones Financial Services came from Florence to Market Street, the Wireless Zone just opened up on Main Street, and the Grateful Hound just opened like a week ago uh, in the old deals and steals deals and steel space on Main Street. Um, Do you have the new occupant of the former subway? I don't. Okay, um, I'm aware just... that it's a food provider. Falafel. It's going to be a, a peed up pocket. I think they're called. They're an independent uh, store from uh, Amherst and New Hampshire. Okay. Thank you. Delicious, actually. Uh, business transitions and modifications. Um, the Hempist moved down to Gone Street for Main Street. Um, on a positive, the A to Z Science and Learning Store had a successful retention to new local ownership, so it's going to remain in place. Faces also was acquired, I think, by Hanush Jewelers, and I think that is also a very positive retention for the downtown. One bar and grill opened up in the former Tully space. Um, what have I got there? The, the Birdhouse Music moved over from Lower King Street up to 164 Main Street, which was the Iris photo space. And the Cedar Chest has undergone a major expansion within Thorns. Um, it, 
there's a point in there, but I'm going to get to it in a second to say something else. <coughs> business closings, the following downtown businesses have closed, Berkshire Yogurt on Bridge Street, <coughs> the Subway, as just we just mentioned, the Iris Photo on Main Street, United Bank at 180 Main Street, Hinge at 48 Main Street, Western Village Ski and Sports for 32 Main Street. That building um, sold uh, just a few weeks ago, um, and that's a positive. Um, Mercantile on 104 Main Street, Deals on Main, which is now being occupied by the um, Grateful Hound, and the Sura restaurant, restaurant space is now occupied by Bombay Royale. So what I want to do the next time we do this is to be able to say how long a retail portal was empty. But I think when you look at this list, you can see that a lot of these retail portals, with one or two exceptions, have been vacant for a month or two months or three months and then had someone else come in its place. We have other retail portals that just continue to remain vacant. But we need to dis make a distinction when we're analyzing them to that to the extent of the classic DOM, days on market, so we can start to measure you know, how, how healthy it is. Because I know if we look at right now and say, you know, there's, I forget what the number is, how many, how many vacant retail store openings we have, it's still important to measure, are they being filled and how long are they remaining open? Uh, and I'm not trying to understate or overstate it because there's also anecdotal experts in the downtown that are saying that there are other retailers who are waiting for others to transition and find a buyer and then they'll position their property for sale, that they don't want to position their property when there are a few others at, at the same time. So we might be seeing some of that as well. But I would also say, and another positive for downtown, Thorns has, has stated to me that they are fully leased for the first time in their 40 years of operating, um, and they've conducted some very exciting expansions and retentions within that property. So as this presentation goes along, I'm going to continue to throw out what I think are very positives about the downtown as well as we discuss some of the challenges. There's a new vacancy in Thorns. Is that already been rented? Downstairs, the computer store downstairs? The click the space. Click, click, yeah, that just yes. empty. Yeah. That's unrented? Oh, I don't know if it's been rented, but I, I did, you had a question. I've just said, been told the same thing, that they're 100% rented. So I assume it's been okay. spoken. I have, can I ask one quick question? I don't oh, yeah, know sure. your flow, but no, not at all. maybe this is, come back to us later with this, but can you offer any generalizations as to the reasons, th those businesses that are, that, are, that are shut down, uh, can you offer any generalizations as to why, in some cases it's just aging out and retiring <coughs> of, of original owners. And are there any incidents of competitive business cost pressure cited as the reason for closing? I think I, I, it, I'm looking at the specific, the, the, the Western Village ski and sports owner said he just, he told the Republican that he was interested in retiring and moving on. Um, the, the, uh, fo the owner of Iris Photo also said as much to the Republican that he felt he could continue to operate, but he wanted to, it was to reach a point where he wanted to move on. I'm not. Having said that, I don't want to answer the question. I think that's an excellent question, and I think we have to almost start engaging in, what do you call it, uh, post-employment exit interviews? interviews? Exit interviews, yes, yes. Exit I, interviews, I, I, I think mean, we talk a lot about why people come, but it'd be very interesting to, to, to understand the reasons for... Your question is extremely cogent, because I think if you listen to what some of Suzanne reported earlier from her survey, which is the first that I've heard of that survey, um, I think that that raises, it, it, it amplifies your question, and I agree with it. You have business owners obviously saying within that chamber survey, and that was a chamber internal survey, um, that their, their concerns about whether they're sustaining enough of an operating revenue stream to keep them in business, and it's causing them a concern. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm, that's, you know, I'm, I'm with you on your question. Any other? Um, on an exciting note, there are a significant number of historically significant projects for the downtown. Um, you have an independent living 
company that is looking to redevelop the St. John's Kansas Church. Um, they have started to move out into the community to start to communicate with, with the Neighborhood Association. Uh, they've met with key stakeholders. It would be a 61 unit independent living facility. Um, it is a credit to this city, I think, that a very, it's a very high compliment to this city that you have an organization that is seeking a community that is walkable, that's bikeable, that has a vibrant downtown, that is, you know, has, has, the, has good numbers to come and do business, and so they've selected this as a city to, to build one of these facilities because it's extremely exciting to think that you're going to have 61 units in the downtown of people who are going to have disposable incomes and are going to be able to come and patronize the shops and make downtown you know more more exciting and viable and i think it adds to the strength of the market street and the holly street corridor because across the street you have the 33 <coughs> holly street project which i'll talk about next and then further up on market street you have the click space um, and we'll get to that in which you have click spaces building is converting a 9,000 square foot building and upgrading it into a fully serviceable office building that'll have traditional law office space on the third floor and then collaborative um, office space for individual entrepreneurs, freelancers, digital nomads, all the, the funny geek words that are out in the vocabulary now. They currently have a significant presence in the city at the Hampshire Court where they take 1,500 square feet. So this is an expansion for them. But again, to have that kind of office space in our downtown is extremely exciting and very positive. So the whole Holy Street, Market Street corridor is looking to be a whole nother extension of the downtown with a great degree of vibrancy. So I think that bodes well you know, for, for the future. The Pulaski Park renovations coming in at $3.6 million. Um, the ability of the city to take a, a downtown urban park and to upgrade it and re-landscape it and redesign it is highly complementary to the city as well and is going to go, I think, a long way toward making downtown more attractive and more livable and more um, pedestrian friendly. Um, I think I could you know, talk about it all day long. I think it's going to be very, very exciting to have that park sitting next to the academy. Um, I think in, in the next, to, to give a tangible example, uh, of what I'm hinting at or, or talking about is the next project is the Czech Writers Corporation, which is renovating buildings up at the Clark School campus so that they can move their, I think, 45 or 50 employees into that property, primarily because they want to be in downtown Northampton. That has been a goal of Czech Writers to try to find a home for their company in and around the downtown of the Northampton because they really like the vibrancy of downtown Northampton, not only for their employees, but for the fact that they are a client-driven business and they're constantly having clients come in to meet with them to go over their accounts and the ability to take those people into the downtown for lunch or a walk is very, very important. Um, so again, you see a spin-off of how you can do things to grow your downtown that might seem intangible or oblique, but in reality they're very direct in the impact that they have. Um, click workspace, we, we touched on that. Um, that's on the list. Um, the Smith College, I think, has invested a half, one and a half million dollars to redesign the Graycourt Gate at Smith and Elm, and I think that is really the front door to the university, and it's somewhat the front door to our downtown as well. I think it's very positive um, to see that that's been completed, and I think it looks beautiful. Um, the Academy of Music is also a huge downtown city asset that has 116 performances a year, draws 50,000 people a year, that's almost 1,000 people a week. Um, it's becoming a, an, an entity that provides programming all through the week, um, whether it's educational or performance driven or cultural, um, they have a very vibrant director and a board of directors that continues to find grants and other forms of financial assistance to physically improve and upgrade the buildings that's going to continue to operate as an asset for downtown. Um, and its ability to, um, again, draw 50,000 people a year. Uh, uh, and, and unlike some of the other entertainment venues, which might have massive you know, large attendance, but they're, they're occasional and they're, you know, weekend or seasonal. This is an institution that's delivering this every week, week in and week out. And I think that's really, a, 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 you know, a good, a good thing. It's, it's, it's qual quantity versus, you know, consistency, if you will. Um, so those are 
some of the exciting projects that I think are going to help grow downtown. Um, storefront vacancies. Um, we have, by my count, um, there are 14 vacant storefronts out of 204 retail spaces, which translate to a vacancy rate of 7%. There are seven empty buildings or properties in downtown. And the property that's on Center Street, 55 Center Street, which is a 4,800 square foot, looks like a brand new building. It's across the street from State Street Deli. I identify that building as an interesting uh, bellwether. It's, according to brokers, it's been empty for three years. It hasn't found a, a, a suitor. Um, and it says to me that we haven't grown retail per se in the downtown or we haven't built new retail in the downtown. I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just saying it's, it's a test of the market. That, that if we do have plans that ever come where someone says, oh, I want to grow more retail, I think we have to really look at that carefully and, and decide whether we can take on more supply versus the demand that we have. Because if the meals tax money is flat and hotel occupancy stays flat, then we have to wonder, is the visitorship going to stay flat? And we'll get to that. We have to try to analyze what's driving more retail. Um, <clears throat> can you contextualize the vacancy rate? Is 7% normal for yeah, cities? Is it low? Is it high? Is it my answer, is, uh, my answer w would, isn't going to surprise you. I, I, I think if we look at each individual storefront, I think that's the way to go, and I think and what I mentioned earlier, the key to me is whether some of these vacant storefronts, how long they stay vacant, and whether they're vacant for long periods of time. Then I think you have to be concerned, because with, with the Grateful Hound goes into deals and steals, and, and Verizon goes into the United Bank space, and Subway moved in after the dry cleaner moved out, and granted Subway failed, but now it sounds like there's another buyer that's into the Subway space. So if you see this you know, flow, then I think you, you, you can be comfortable that, you can be comfortable that the buildings are full, but then you have to raise the question, I think, too, is that, is that a sustainable model, too? Why, you know, why did, why did, and that leads to what Dennis is saying, I think we need to engage in exit interviews to say, are these businesses, is it good to have that kind of turnover? So I understand that contextualization, but I'm wondering about just kind of on a rolling basis at any given time to have a 7% vacancy rate, does that, Makes sense? Is that considered unusual yeah. in most cities of similar size? I, I would, I would have to research that to give you a good answer. I'm not going to opine if it's. I don't think it's. It's not as bad as I thought it would be. So I, I personally, but that's just my own view. Um, so, but I think it deserves a you know a little better answer, and we'll have to work on that. Just um, um, maybe as a way of adding a fee or a column. Because um, some of these have been vacant for a long time, just to show us the Spoletto's, the Kathy's Diner, um, just so you have a sense of which have been vacant for 10 years and which have been vacant for, you know, three months. I've been told the Kathy Diner space has work being done on it. I was contacted months ago by an, in by an individual who claimed they were going to open a business there. I have not heard from them since. So that space I have a little hope for. Um, Spoletto's is right on there. Correct. Yeah. Um, there are a number of properties that are in fact owned by one organization. Yeah, okay. And I think you're gonna have to, you know, understand that dynamic. Um, the, um, <coughs> let's see here, 450 Main Street Spoletto's, 8 Pearl Street Gas Station, that I think it's very interesting that 8 Pearl Street gas station sits next to the old K Lane auto dealership property. Now, the K Lane auto de dealership property announced they were going to move, and this very high end body art tattoo organization came, had a very quick negotiation for a lease. They moved right in, they've been there ever since, and it's a very impressive business that they run. They, they took this property because it had on-site parking to accommodate their clientele that comes here to have their work done. And I think it's, and they stay here, and I think it's a, they're great partners, they're really easy to deal with. 
So you have two properties sitting next to each other. They're both identical size, identical types of buildings. One is empty and one isn't. So yeah, in the future, it might be interesting if you had like DOM information, you know, next to the each business. Okay. So just to have a, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Vacant buildings are 6th Strong Avenue, Kathy's Diner, the Pearl Street Gas Station, um, 56 Pleasant Street, which is, with me here, um, 58. 58 Pleasant Street is um, the gas station, the King Automotive gas station by the lumber yard. 55 Center Street is the building we referred to before. Um, no, I'm sorry, I'm incorrect. 50? Table 9, maybe? Um, yeah. Pardon? Table nine? Yeah. Is that the table nine? Um, no, it's the one they just renovated next to the right now. I what I'm curious about in these um, in this list is that you have some really short streets that have three major properties yeah. and then you have Main Street. I mean I, I think that also it'd be useful to have some kind of analysis that really kind of looks at what the differences are between the different streets and what the particular reasons, you know, for different areas are um, for the vacancies, because just looking at a list also doesn't give us kind of the quantitative information, that uh, quality, sorry, qualitative information that would be really useful. Sure. Um, 56 Pleasant Street would be the Marinello um, Beauty School building. Pardon my... Well, <laughs> Okay, so we've covered the properties. Um, okay, retail rents. What I've done here is, and this list is designed to compare the city's retail rents against some surrounding cities and to also compare it to some major retail markets in in Connecticut and, and New York. Um, right now, and I've also divided what um, the counselor had just suggested about different neighborhoods within the overall downtown. What I've done here is I've broken Northampton into four sections. Downtown center, which is much of Main Street, Main Street center, um, Pleasant Street, and by Pleasant Street I mean Pleasant Street going from where Florence Bank is running down to below Union Station, maybe down toward the lumber yard and stopping there. Um, no, excuse me, Pleasant Street down to Pearl, excuse me, stopping at Pearl. The rents markedly change below Pearl. Um, King and Center Streets are the northern edge of the downtown. I have taken comparisons to Amherst, Chicopee, Holyoke, New Haven, Hartford, Stanford, White Plains, and then Greenwich. I've collected over 50 sample properties off of LoopNet, off the Commercial Real Estate Magazine, um, off newspaper ads um, that, I've, that I've collected to try to create what are asking rents. I don't know what the taking rents are. Uh, this is purely asking rents. I've spoken to brokers anecdotally to also vet these numbers with. So what I come out with is for Northampton, downtown center is $27 range. The main street is $33 to $42 a foot, and in some cases could be higher than that. And let me also say these asking rents may or may not include the responsibility to pay the taxes as well. So they may not be um, gross rents or net gross rents, excuse me. Pleasant Street, $23 to $29. Um, where the Eileen Fisher space is, um, the Marinello Realty Corridor, um, and then King and Center Street is 20 to $21. And where um, the Northampton Bank is and Sutter Meets and Pure Bar, the new fitness center, the rents there are 13 to 15 or $16, um, just for the sense of accuracy. Rents in Amherst are pretty close to us. 26 to 32 dollars a foot. So the average for Amherst is 29. Um, Chicopee and Holyoke are 10 to 11, 12 dollars a square foot. Rents in New Haven average out at about 34 dollars. 
uh, Hartford is $26. And my Hartford, all of my solicitations for Hartford, New Haven, Stanford, and White Plains comes from my, also a lot of my own personal observation. I've picked downtown sites. I've not just taken anywhere in those cities. I've stuck to the same downtown core that we have here. Um, Stanford is $35, White Plains is $39, and Greenwich is $105, just to throw that in for yucks. Um, so you could see that we are in a very healthy position in terms of commanding rents. Um, two questions. Do you have any sense of what percent of rental agreements are triple net leases? No, I don't know. The, uh, ultimately, the, le the lease becomes a part of the private agreement between the, the, the owner and the lessee. And then when that organization deals with the assessor's office to describe their assessment, they provide profit and loss statements to the assessor, but those are almost confidential and not, they're not quite public because it's privy to the assessor and that business. I believe I'm representing that accurately. So it inhibits my ability to go out and publicize it. And I'm not publicizing any specific property in any of my conversation this evening because we're going to eventually get to the list of building values. And in that case, I just list addresses without stating who owns the building or where the building is. Um, and did you um, look at East Hampton at all? I feel like, you know, we hear a lot that we lose a lot of, of businesses to East Hampton these days. I, I walked the East Hampton downtown as well as the Amherst downtown. And I also want to say that we have 190 stores. Amherst has about 75 stores and East Hampton is about 50 to 60 stores. Um, in walking East Hampton, they, their, their, their retail is much different than ours, and I think their rents would be very far below ours. So I really made no effort to try to, to find, you know, to try to draw that comparison. I think Chicopee and Holyoke would be enough of a benchmark to show you where we are relative to some of the other sister cities. Um, and, and, I thought of Springfield, but with Springfield, when you get to their retail listings, they're all over. It's not just core downtown. It's out in some of the other areas near 291, so I didn't draw that in either. But. Um, I'm curious about Market Street, partly because I feel like it's kind of a neighborhood that is kind of up and coming and has been for the last decade or so, and um, you know what has made it that? And how is kind of the expansion down Pleasant Street with the mixed-use building, the affordable housing building that's going up, and the uh, John, St. John Cantius building turning into a residence? I mean, I just think there's so much kind of activity there that's going to be very interesting in terms of how um, areas, the, the downtown area and that area develops. And I think it would be really useful for us to kind of be tracking that as we move forward. Um, I think it's also just an interesting story how different neighborhoods have different kind of personalities and what draws particular kinds of businesses to particular areas. So, and I know that's, a, that's beyond the scope of this particular study, but I think it would be really useful to help us to kind of understand trends in the city and also how to encourage trends to develop. I totally agree. No, I totally agree. And, I, and part of the click space, um, moving in is their interest in <coughs> cultivating bikeability and we're working with them to try to construct some bike racks near their building um, so they can use that as a form of commutation and the city is in <coughs> essence working toward creating more bikeable and walkable infrastructure within the downtown and that obviously has the attention of the click space people and the planning department with Wayne Fiden is trying to work with community stakeholders and neighborhood associations and has applied last year or this year for a MassWorks grant to redesign and re-landscape Pleasant Street, which I think is a hugely exciting effort because that's going to also help expand and grow the downtown in terms of residential apartments, more hopefully maybe a little bit more retail, um, and then anchored by the HAP housing project and the Lumberyard housing project, I think it's going to be very, very exciting. So you have two parallel growth areas, Pleasant Street and the Hawley Street. Um, one, secreta the Secretary Ash came to Northampton maybe three months ago, four months ago, and the mayor entertained him for two hours. And what the mayor did was um, drove him to all these sites. We went to Click Space, we went to the Lumberyard, we went to Hap Housing, and in each of those particular places, 
the stakeholders or the managers of those visions or those projects were there to talk to the secretary about and answer questions about you know their their what they were what would we hope to do and hope to create and it was also a way of lobbying for the MassWorks grant to help upgrade Pleasant Street. And I think the secretary got that vision um, very, very clearly. And so hopefully when Wayne applies again, it, it might be, you know, it might win this time because he could clearly see that the, the value of upgrading Pleasant Street with the commitment to public housing. And the secretary was very proactive about the public housing. He was I think very the key to some of this is just the mixed use concept, which, you know, in revitalization of a number of cities across the United States it is it has been key to kind of the, the kind of growing economy I mean downtown Houston for instance was like a wasteland and now because of kind of a mixed-use concept that was put into place there with really livable spaces and retail really intertwined it's kind of it's a model for how cities can be revitalized so I am just, I am really curious about how um, we as a city are framing that concept and how we're thinking about creating more mixed use yeah. spaces and, and just kind of bringing the concept to, uh, to fruition. Yep, I agree. So, are there any questions about the rental composition or? And I'll move on. Oh. No. Does this, th how do people feel about this? Is there any, any impression or, or should I wait till the end and get Thank you. Pardon? This is incredibly helpful. Okay. Able to right. see. Building values. Um, what I've tried to do here is compare the value of either five to eight buildings in Northampton against five to eight buildings in Amherst and five to eight buildings in Middletown, Connecticut. And I want to be clear about, I'm going to read this, uh, similar sized and purpose buildings were sampled from the downtowns of Northampton, Amherst, and Middletown. Middletown is a small sized city with a downtown shared by Wesleyan and Middle Sex Community College. It has income numbers that are a little lower than ours, median and family income. They have 47,000 people, we have 28,000 people, um, but still an interesting uh, comparison. Northampton, um, Northampton buildings had an average price per square foot of $143 versus $81.14 for Middletown, which is a 70% differential. The sampling of Amherst buildings showed a narrow margin, or narrow margin, $128 per square foot versus our $143, which is an 11% margin. Um, so you, you, you can see that the value of property here is where is where it is and again um, I took sample properties that are all similar type buildings um, I did not take any class A buildings I picked buildings that had either residential retail or, or some office in them um, let's see here what else have I got? yeah that's my, my reference notes are there I've read it okay any questions on the building values? Um, I, again, I'm not really sure. I mean, it's considerably different middle town from both Amherst and Northampton. Northampton and Amherst are much closer than either of them are to Middletown. But, um, and I can see why you would want to compare it, having a downtown Westland and kind of community college. <coughs> But what else amounts for the vast difference? Is it, is it, I mean, can, can you, is it, is it just that they don't really have a, I don't really, it doesn't strike me as a destination community, certainly in the same way that Northampton, or even the most country. I, I would, I would say, no, I don't know that I have the final substantive answer. I think that's an excellent question. And it, that's what these numbers are going to do. They're going yeah. to beg further questions. Okay. And, and, but obviously, I don't know that downtown Middletown can say it's going to draw, and we'll get to those numbers, three, four, five, six hundred thousand people yeah, a year. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, the destination piece might be the... Might be the yes. I th oh, I, yeah, I, yeah. I would say that's got to be the major driver, right. that, that if you open a store in Middletown, you're going to have X come through that door, right. whereas that door is sitting in Northampton, X plus X is going to come through the door. Right. And then that, in essence, 
creates the, the justification for demanding, you know, a higher rent or a higher building value. Well, the, the building value is going to be based on what the rent is. I mean, it, it's um, and what someone's willing. Go ahead. I don't know what the population is, but I wonder if uh, Williamstown would be. A, he just. Oh, no. oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I wonder if Williamstown would be a comparison, um, which has, you know, has um, a lot of sort of as museums and is, I think, in a destination location. Yep. Key local revenues. Um, hotel occupancy is for every time somebody stays at a hotel in Northampton, they pay an 11% occupancy tax. 5% of that tax goes to the state of Massachusetts and 6% comes to the city as revenue. And if you look at the revenues for hotel tax, um, and let me say that if I take the hotel tax revenue and I multiply it by the average daily room rate for a hotel, and I multiply that times 1.5 people per room, which is the hotel industry average for how many people stay in a hotel room. It's not quite one and it's not quite two, it's 1.5. You can come up with how many people actually stay in a hotel. And so the Fairfield Inn will, in essence, house 20,000 people a year um, at, at a certain percentage. Um, overall, all of our hotels draw about 100,000 people a year, by my estimate, to the city, and we'll get to that. I'm getting out of sequence. But you can see the, the, the tax revenues have been flat. Um, they're, all, they're pretty much the same since 2012. Um, there was, there's been an increase in hotel revenue since the Fairfield Inn opened, but now that the Clarion has closed, I think you're going to see that number go right back to where it was. I wish like it wasn't so, but I think it's... Um, meals tax revenues have all also been pretty much stable at either six hundred sixty thousand to six hundred and seventy thousand um, dollars since 2012. There's been no real uptick um, or trend to prove that there's been any increase. It's the same number. I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't know if that means there's not more people coming, um, or maybe the cost of food is just not rising. Um, but I lay it out there that it's certainly not, you know, a, a number that's going through the roof. But it shows sort of a stability in terms of how many people are going to restaurants, right? I feel like anecdotally you hear things like, oh, no one goes, you know, the people don't go to restaurants anymore, or go downtown. But this would say that it's a fairly consistent. True. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, parking revenues also have been since 012 hovering around 1.8, 1.7, 1.9 million dollars a year. Now, that's a number that's based on a fixed number of parking spaces, so there's a ceiling to that number if you follow what I'm saying, where with the hotel number or the meals tax number, that number could go much higher than it is right now. But nevertheless, it's another indicator that shows a plateau of revenue since 2012. Just a quick um, kind of technical question. So, Q1 would be kind of the summer, the end of the summer, correct? I'm just wondering if there are particular times when we look at the restaurant and so forth that the, the quarters are going to be higher than other quarters. Yes. Yes. Um, and when we say quarter one and quarter two, that's fiscal year quarter one and quarter two. Okay, right. good. Yeah, no. Right. <laughs> July through December. Yeah, so it, it, you got to have the right denominator. I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> trying to figure just, this I was out. thinking about it because of looking at 2016, if we continue with um, similar revenues in this, the third and fourth quarters, we will kind of see an uptick, which I wonder if that has to do with the economy changing or something. I, I'm, just, I'm just curious about that. The third quarter number for 016 will be the first quarter that will reflect the closing of the Clarion. So if that next quarter number continues to bump up like they have for the first two quarters, then that would be good news. But if that third quarter number falls back to where the other was, you'll know it was, that's yeah. the moment in time. I was looking at the meals tax, but yeah, you're absolutely Cause right. Because the Clarion closed in November of 2015, which is the fourth quarter of 2015. But from a fiscal year perspective, I think it's the-, the second quarter of this year 16. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what that number says. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it, 
the closing of the Clarion raises a very interesting question is what is our hotel capacity? Because it's not clear that another hotel may be built there and it raises the question of whether the city can absorb another hotel. It doesn't hurt the others, but if can it handle four? Because visitorship is an important driver for the city um, and hotels certainly um, do that. Um, is there any, have you looked at all into um, you know Airbnb and, and uh, different ways that those, you know, that could be absorbed or is I, being absorbed? I think the Airbnb is an excellent question and I will have an answer for that because I definitely plan to include that in trying to assess what the hotel market is. Um, I've talked to three tourism directors about where Air, Airbnbs are going and, and I'm able, I will be able to figure out how many Airbnbs we have in the city. We have quite a few. Um, and I think that'd be a fascinating statistic to add to the fact that we currently have right now, we had 458 hotel rooms in the city. With the Clarion closing, we're back down to 350. But it would be fascinating. I, I'd definitely be able to do that add in the Airbnb to say, well, how many more functioning rooms? I'm sorry. I'll, I'll just add a quick anecdote. Uh, folks in, in Provincetown told me that they estimate the impact, if, if they were collecting hotel occupancy tax on the Airbnbs in Provincetown, they would collect another million dollars in yeah. the local revenue. Now, obviously, it's a different scale. It's a different but, scale. Yeah. But there are revenue implications to uh, totally. the, the growth in the Airbnb market. My question was just about the subjectivity to local tax, to the hotel tax. And are they just not subject? I don't think right. they are. My understanding is state legislation would be required to allow municipalities to include Airbnbs in the, under the coverage of the occupancy tax. Right, but just a, a standard B&B is subject. Yep. Right, so, okay. So we're just waiting for, I mean, it's a matter of time. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, the final tab is uh, attendance figures and estimates. What I've tried to do is um, I've given you attendance 012, 13, 14, and 15, um, the Academy Music, <clears throat> which is at about 50,000, um, hotel guest visitorship, and a very conservative calculation of 55 or 60 percent occupancy. Um, it, I draw that to 126, 106,000 people a year. I bump the number up for 015 because of the Fairfield Inn. Um, I would also say that I have seen Smith Travel Research hotel occupancy reports and they mirror that statistic that comes out of the hotel tax revenues. But we're not allowed to quote Smith Travel Research, so I won't do that. But it's another, con you know, it's another you know, piece of evidence to try to figure out <clears throat> what our hotel occupancy is. Um, the Amtrak in Northampton is going to take 16,000 people on and off the platform for 2015. So that's a new driver into downtown. The Smith Museum and Historic Northampton draw six to 8,000 people a year. Um, First Night had a very good year this year. That and the summer sidewalk sales draws 20 to 24,000 people a year. The summer concert series is at 4,000. The hot chocolate run five to seven thousand. Um, I'm trying to figure out what the attendance would be for the Pride Parade. I've listed it at eight, but it might be more than that. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, the Calvin, the Iron Horse, and Pearl Street, we've asked if we could have some, uh, any information on attendance. We've not received an answer to that request. Um, three County Fairgrounds, they supply us with attendance figures, and they range from 130 to 160,000 people a year. Um, the Paradise City Arts Festival, which is twice a summer, draws 60,000. Uh, the Morgan Horse Shows draw 16,000. So you can see that it's a very health, those are very healthy numbers. How many are expected at the extravagant? Oh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> 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 How many? Did, I don't know. Do you have a number, Ryan? Do you? Me? Um, well, five man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so when, when the organizers came to the Ward Three Association. I had originally heard something like 6,000, but they threw out the number 10 at some point. So, a lot. Is the answer. 
six to ten thousand maybe. I'm not sure if they know. Just ask Amherst. Much more than Amherst. That's true. That's not, um, it's also yeah, that's one final thing to say is that the city's tax rate is sixteen dollars per thousand. We do not have a commercial rate. We do not have an industrial rate. We do not have a retail rate. I'm going to eventually add a column to the building value rate to show what the tax bill is because obviously with these downtown that have a commercial rate, the property tax bill can be somewhere 40, 50, 60 percent more than ours. So I think that's also to the city's advantage that on a million dollar building, your tax bill is $16,000. It could be 30 or more in another locality. Thank you so much. Sure. This is um, it's exciting to be the first recipients of this information. So I really appreciate you coming in and staying so oh, yeah, no. late to talk to us. It's, and I would say this is a start. I think they'll yeah. <coughs> continue to add more data columns um, and sharpen the information. And um, so, yeah. Good. Thank you. And is it okay if, um, if the committee sends questions, if we have further questions to me and then I send them to you? Sure. Okay? Thank you. Just a yeah, really, sure. quick, really quick general question. So you don't have plans to necessarily provide any kind of quantitative anal qualitative analysis to go with the, these indicators, it sounds like. Is that true? I'm, <clears throat> what I plan to do is, at minimum, this becomes an annual and maybe biannual. Um, and I'm happy to <clears throat> put, you know, whatever kind of, like when you say qualitative analysis, like, per neighborhood, per street, or just the overall downtown, or? It would be analysis, I think, that kind of looks at some of the differences and the things that you're comparing, and just, I mean, there's got to be a little bit of narrative, I think, to give us more of a sense of. Like an overall summary. It just context, I think, that it, it's, it's going to be hard, I think, for people looking at this to kind of really figure out <coughs> a lot of the context that surround numbers. Interviews or surveys or? What I will do is create that kind of a qualitative summary or an overview and I'll vet that with a few other people who are in the real estate market so that, that I get some concurrence and then I'll be happy to do that. I, I, I think what you're saying is appropriate because I'm in presenting these numbers I'm still kind of measuring twice and cutting once. I don't want to run out and say oh this is really high and that's really low I, I, and someone's going to say oh you're completely wrong. So. I haven't gone to that level of what you're saying that, oh, this is good and that's bad and this needs to be changed. But I think you're right. There needs to be that kind of analysis. So I would definitely work on that. Because uh, I went to Great Pains with Middletown to walk the downtown, collect the properties. I spoke to two or three brokers in their downtown to get a real feel that I wasn't representing any of the numbers coming from there. So yeah, I can do that. That's, that's yeah, definitely. Uh, two things. First, just thank you so much. For, sure. for, I mean, I, I, I've known this was in the works, um, but it, 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 it really is invaluable as, as we begin to absorb it. And, and I hope you'll understand that to, to look at something that obviously triggers a, a lot more questions. Well, that's yeah. interesting. It'd be even more interesting. So, so <laughs> what, what, it, it what, triggers what, more questions, like like Councillor Carney said. For more info categories, so yeah, that's what this is all you about. Have limited time, so 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 don't don't mind us if we ask questions. Sure, that yeah, no, are just no, not possible to answer right now, yeah. but we can't help but have questions because it's such a such a good start. The the, the, the second thing is that, and this <coughs> is the stepping back, you know, to begin to see the the forest and not so much all the individual trees, which is what all of us need to start doing at some point, but. It'd be interesting as we deliberate on all this in the, in the months ahead for your thoughts on, okay, what does this mean in terms of policy initiatives that the city should take to uh, strengthen what we're, what, what, what we're seeing about the downtown economy? Should we be pushing the legislature as a, as a high priority to um, you know, expand the definition of what's covered by the occupancy tax so that we can, you know, you know th th there's, so it'd be very interesting from your perspective, uh, if, if over time you'd be willing to share with us. Well, what, what, what's, what's this all mean, and what could the city council do to to further your efforts and the mayor's and bringing business to downtown and improving the health of downtown? I, one issue that I would leave, which I think is 
in the paper a lot, and the, the Valley Advocate had a headline, which is totally accurate, is that we all want increased rail service, and it's not entirely clear that we're going to get it, and we really need to lobby and advocate for it when we see our state representatives to, to sort of say that that's a good thing, and we're not talking hourly trains, we're talking maybe two or three trains in the morning or two or three trains in the afternoon to start to connect people who live here with the eastern seaboard and the northeast corridor. And I think for Franklin County in particular, the impact that has on people who might want a second home or a primary home or a weekend home, there's so many people in our economy who are the type of people that are at the click space. They don't work in traditional 40 hour a week, nine to five jobs but they do jobs that are intellectually driven, capital driven, and they work and they have to travel and the rail gives them that connection to New York City. That, Vermonter's great, and it's 16,000 people a year, but it comes in at you know, 11 o'clock in the morning and it doesn't come back up till 4.30 in the evening and we could get some kind of rail service. And I would also say that the rail service that's gonna to go to Springfield with the governor of Connecticut committing to 12 trains a day into Springfield is going to put us closer into Penn Station and New York City than ever before, and I think that's going to be very good for the whole region. So, just uh, so things that the city council can do around that, or just kind of individual lobbying, as opposed to even um, looking at what was mentioned in terms of uh, occupancy taxes. Um, certainly, when there's state legislation that comes up, we could be as a council we can you know, do a resolution to support such, uh, such a tax. I mean, just because of the, you know, if you look at the numbers in Northampton or anything like Providence County, I mean, that million dollars can go a long way. Thank you so sure. much, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public who's been on this long ride with us who would like to comment? No? I will. Yes? But the ride was fun. I'm so happy. You enjoyed it. I mean, I learned the same things that you did. Um, Please I, yourself. I'm sorry. So, yes, so for the people who aren't watching this, um, my name is Jasper Lapienske. I live at 43 West Street, which makes me a constituent of Councillor Bidwell. Um, I, I think that I will probably put in my sort of, when, when you have the one that's directed more towards consumers, because I don't work in downtown, at least not at the moment. Um, so that's, that's where I fit in on that. But what I want to say tonight is that I think that, and this is just in general, um, not just to this committee, but I think that the city council should really exercise a lot of caution when soliciting reports from and bestowing compliments on the Chamber of Commerce. Because keep in mind, the Chamber of Commerce is an organization that spent, I believe, $75 million in 2012 trying to get Mitt Romney elected president. They are to small businesses what fur seals are to penguins, right? That's just not where they are. They're, they, they, they would like to see Coke Industries take over Thorns. They would like to see Exxon Mobil run Smith College. That's just, it, to have them here representing small businesses, I think is, I mean, this is not, everyone does this, so I, it's not, this is not to single out this committee or even this city, right? I mean, Greenfield, Amherst, East Hampton, everyone's dependent on the Chamber of Commerce, but it comes at a really steep cost to local businesses and to our democracy to be able to function and at a more granular level to the seriousness of the reports that they give because i just don't think that they have east side grill in mind when they have a big organization a big event there that you can only attend if you're a member of the chamber of commerce and you pay one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, whatever i'm exaggerating on that number i don't remember exactly what it was but it's just it's it's not i, I don't think it's ethical to have them in here and especially not when they say that they're representing locally owned businesses. They are demonstrably not uh, representative of locally owned businesses, and I think that the demise of locally owned businesses is the only thing that they are really interested in. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair, yes. uh, that, that requires a, a, a factual rebuttal. Thank you. Um, this, the, the Greater, I, I speak as a former board member for six years of the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce. Um, 
that Chamber of Commerce bears absolutely no legal relationship to the National Chamber of Commerce. Zero. As a matter of fact, there's, it's a, you can imagine, for reasons, it's a big marketing problem for them. They're thinking about changing their name. They're thinking about rebranding themselves because there is that confusion. But it, there is zero relationship. And, and I can also tell you that the politics of this local chamber is about a 180 degrees different from the national chamber. There is no relationship whatsoever, none. And I can also tell that this chamber of commerce is totally committed to representing the east side grills of the world. Um, so, so th th this uh, th nothing I've said here is opinion. Everything I've said here is, is, is absolute fact. So, so when you talk about being careful about saying things in public and be careful about inviting, we all need to be careful about things like that too, because it's just it's just it's just wrong. With all due respect, my dear constituent. Okay, so um, we're that we received and unless unless we want to schedule any further hearings now we're going to decide at that point to schedule hearings, hearings. Right. I think so I mean I think if we learned one thing today and we learned a bazillion things today it's that there's so this is even broader with more information in depth than we but we might we have tasks that we might be yeah. moving towards is that that I think in the work plan we talked about Counselors might move forward in different directions based on some of the data that we received today. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll we'll take it back up and figure it out. And again, we we may have to ask for an extension to our deadline or uh, figure out a way to be able to cover all of these things to the degree that we'd like to. It depends on how much. I mean, how how broad we want to go in terms of recommendations. Um, you know, as we talked earlier, we said we might just focus on one or two areas. We could decide at that point if we yeah. want to do that. I guess we'll talk about that more in okay. um, Would someone like to make a motion? I move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you everyone for... Uh,